Well, I hope you enjoyed that music intro that uh, I just played for you. And uh, I'm going to try to get the name for you because I don't remember it right off the top. So it looks like it's called Nocturmi, Nocturmi, which is a classical piece, obviously a piano piece. And I just had kind of a, a desire to listen to some piano music through the theme of this premiere. And the machine you're looking at through the camera right now that you just saw do the initial sew off with that heavy gray genuine elk hide belongs to really almost a, a star on this channel now because we've talked about him so much. And that is uh, my good friend down in Florida, John Smith. And John Smith, you might remember, he's the one that I interviewed. He worked uh, within the Navy on sewing machines. Uh, he was a master parachute rigger and then went on to work for NASA as well, helping with the space shuttle program and the parachutes that they would deploy when they had the solid, solid rocket boosters and other components of the spaceship that needed to float back down to Earth uh, very safely. And John was involved with those parachutes uh, as well. So he's had an interesting life working with sewing machines but a lot of those machines were more on the commercial light industrial side. And so when he ran into some challenges with his Swedish beauty, the one you're seeing on the screen right now, the Type 21, he said, I'm going to reach out to my friend Scott up in Wisconsin, send him the machine and get his help on it. And I think that's super cool. We can always help each other in one way or, one way or another. And we all have gifts and talents and knowledge areas. And uh, I'm sure if I needed help on a, com uh, on a certain commercial machine that John had put his hands on before, he would be more than willing to jump in and help me out as well. So, uh, but this is his machine, believe it or not. And any of you that follow me real faithfully and you watch the unboxing uh, and you saw the uh, just, I guess, just kind of the, the not so pretty appearance of John's machine, it had a lot of uh, blemishes on it, had varnishing, had rust, had all kinds of things going on with it. And uh, again, a little bit outside of the scope of what a normal service would include. If you tr try to take your machine into a local service center and say, by the way, I want you to do uh, a, a detailing on this machine as well, they're probably going to look at you a little bit squirrely. And they're going to say, yeah, we don't do that sort of thing. We're just going to, we're going to do a service on it. And uh, in all likelihood, they're going to spend about 30 to 45 minutes. I've said this before in other premieres. If you follow me, you know that. So uh, my service approach is different here. If I get a machine in and I see a need, in all likelihood, I'm going to take care of that need. And I'm not always going to add it to the invoice at the end. And uh, John is just such a, a great guy and has done so many great things in his life to uh, help our country out and through his service in the Navy, his service uh, through the programs at NASA. Uh, I wanted to send his Swedish beauty back looking different than it, than it did when it arrived. And certainly sewing different as well because it wasn't just an appearance standpoint with John Smith's machine. There were also a number of mechanical challenges as well. In fact, when it arrived, it wouldn't even run. There were some major issues with the motor that needed to be addressed. But I'll tell you one thing, that machine runs like a totally different machine now. As a matter of fact, let me grab a bobbin because I'm going to pop a bobbin onto the machine and just fire it up for you real quick. Because otherwise, I'm probably during the course of the sew-offs that I have planned, I'm not going to have the opportunity to show you the strength that's renewed in that motor. And I want to do that. So give me a second here. Give me just a, a, a moment and I will see if I can locate a Husqvarna bobbin. And in the meantime, I'll put on some more uh, pretty music for you. This one is called Wandering, Wandering Soul. And I'm going to turn the volume down because we're probably going to jump into some sew-offs and stuff lately uh, in just a little bit anyway.
So once again, John's machine arrived and it was not even running. Uh, he had tried to do, uh, I think, a motor brush installation on it and just something went south. And uh, so I had to do quite a bit of work and we'll look at that on Facebook in a little bit. But let me fire this up for you right now and let you listen to the motor. And the way I'm going to do that is basically just uh, disengaging the clutch uh, temporarily. And uh, here we go. Well, you get the idea. It runs now. <laughs> and that's probably a little bit of an understatement. I just noticed something. I, I wanted to do something different with John's machine just to kind of keep it spicy and new. And uh, I put on a roller foot to try it on John's machine, but I can see that it's not aligned in relation to the feed dogs exactly the way that it should be. So let me see if I can fix that real quick. And it might be that the uh, that this particular roller foot doesn't quite fit that shank on this Husqvarna just the way that it should. I just wanted to try it out. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't quite line up on it exactly the way that it should. Uh, but it seemed to do okay with this uh, this leather sew off that we just did. So we'll give it a try. Otherwise, I've got John's other multi-purpose foot that came with the machine and I'll go back to that foot but it's uh it's just a little bit cockeyed to the to the left so we'll give it a try but let me show you the stitch off that we did at the launch of this premiere first before we go any further and we'll take a look at these uh, stitches that uh, John's type 21 which by the way comes with a one point five amp motor but it is not a Swedish motor it is that free Westinghouse motor that I pointed out to you in a premiere um, several 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 months ago uh, I talked about the different uh, uh, the different motors that were used in Husqvarna green machines one of them being the 1.5 amp uh, free Westinghouse motor and that's what John's machine has and these are the stitches we just laid down using that roller foot. And again, I, it's kind of an unknown commodity. I've never tried this particular roller foot on a Swedish beauty before. So we'll have to see. And again, if you're brand new to this channel, let me uh, take my hand off the camera for a second once I get it lined up correctly. And I want you to look at the top of that material. This is genuine elk hide. And genuine elk hide is chemically processed it's incredibly difficult to get through and when you sew a, a piece like this which is about four ounces uh, thick you're talking about sewing the equivalent of a men's belt a men's belt for goodness sakes I'm not kidding you and uh, John's machine just got the job done with that renewed motor after my work on it uh, with no difficulty at all and look at the stitches as well Beautiful stitches from start to finish. I'm going to go ahead and come out on this shot a little bit. So as I love to say, you can look at the totality of the stitching, although that's such a big piece of leather, I'm way out. The stitches look pretty tiny from this distance, don't they? Let me turn it around. Let's look at that lock stitch. And we'll see how this uh, Type 21 with this Westinghouse motor, and I'm going to pull this back real quick first to try to expose those stitches, otherwise that nap is going to make it nearly impossible to see them. I think we can see most of them now that I pulled that, uh, that, I pulled that nap back. I'm going to do it one more time. The nap on this uh, elk hide is really, really thick stuff, and so uh, you have to kind of prime it a little bit for visibility if you want to see what you just sewed. All right, I think I've got about the right angle. It's not perfect, but we should be able to catch a glimpse of those uh, lock stitches on this elk hide. So I'm going to kind of move across, and I won't talk when I'm doing it because I tend to vibrate the camera.
Well, I don't know what you saw, but I'm seeing some drop dead gorgeous lock stitches. Look at there, especially in relation to uh, the nap, where you can really see them popping through. And they're like that all the way down. I can see that from the workbench, but you can't see it because of the nap through the camera, I'm sure. But those are gorgeous stitches. They're just, they just are. They're just spot on. And I can't do the totality because uh, of the length of this thing, and I have to come out so far. But it's an absolute pass as far as uh, this uh, genuine elk kite. I'm going to come out on this shot a little bit so we can look at John's machine again because eventually we're going to be popping over to Facebook and I really want you to get this image burnt into your mind so when you see the uh, the rough state of the machine when it arrived at the workshop, I'm going to throw that to the back as a pass, you're really going to be able to contrast the two in your mind and go, holy mackerel, and this is original paint. Uh, John said, I can't believe you got all that that surface cleaned up to that degree uh, and we didn't lose all the patina. We didn't lose all the green color that's so classic of a Husqvarna Viking green machine. A uh, couple places we actually did, and I did tell him that, a couple places that stuff was so pitted into the paint well below the clear coat uh, that when I worked on that surface very, very carefully, uh, we lost some of the paint finish. But what I did then is I... I Basically, I, I did a masking of this machine and sealed off any of the orifices that would go into the machine. And then I did a light clear coat over the existing patina that was left. Uh, not just to make it prettier, although I think it did, but also so that when that paint is basically stripped down many, many layers to get past that point where that, that horrible surface was just taking away from what is a Swedish beauty, uh, that makes that, that, that existing paint, the stuff that remains, vulnerable to degrading and being, uh, becoming flaky and all that kind of stuff. So that's one of the other reasons that I decided to go to the effort, extra effort of uh, masking the machine off, which is very tedious work, very time consuming, but John's well worth it, uh, so that I could clear coat the machine and seal off that paint that was remaining and give it a nice uh, finish uh, that would preserve the machine uh, much, much longer. And again, we're not talking, it's, it's not gonna have the equivalent appearance of a Swedish beauty that had not gone through all the trauma on the surface that John's machine has, uh, but it certainly, uh, it certainly helped quite a bit. I think you would agree as we look at that machine, uh, even from this distance. And we could certainly zoom in a little bit closer and look at some of the finish as well uh, but uh, it definitely looks different than when it arrived at the workshop. All right. Well, that's that's a real long-winded explanation of uh, of the work that I tried to do uh, to bring this machine back a little bit. Let's go down towards the needle, and we'll look at what the next sew-off might be. Again, this roller foot, which is kind of neat to try. Uh, I like roller feet. I really do. I even like them better than walking feet in certain respects. But this one, again, if we were looking at the machine straight on, you'd see that it's it's just a little bit cockeyed to the left. And again, because the, the, the presser foot shank on the green machines is not just a standard shank, it's got a little bit of a squared edge to it. And while this one does fit nicely, as you can see, it, uh, it's got just a little bit of an alignment issue. So we'll continue to try to use it. If I start to have problems, uh, I'm going to go back to, where is his foot? There it is. I'm going to go back to John's original multi-purpose foot that uh, came with this machine uh, when it came to the workshop. All right. And I better silence my phone. I just realized that I didn't silence my phone in case someone decides to call it during the premiere. As, as you know, as, 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 as has happened more than once, especially the one time I had that very pleasantly persistent individual from Africa that kept calling and kept calling and kept calling. And I was like, holy mackerel, give me a break. What is your sewing machine on fire? I can't put it out from here. There's no way. <laughs> so, all right, so I've got the ringtone down. I've got the notification down. Although my... Computer will continue to make weird sounds. I know it will. 
So let's see what we're going to sew off on next. And I'll just get the next song uh, kind of queued up. And, uh, oops, yeah, there we go. I think we just did Wandering Soul, didn't we? Yeah, let me go down a little bit further. So this next one is uh, that we're going to play after this next sew off is called uh, Hopeful, Hopeful Freedom. Hopeful Freedom. So let me see what we can sew off on next on John's, uh, John's machine. And I just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything that I wanted to share with you. Let me check my little notes here real quick. Yep, I already mentioned it has a free Westinghouse 1.5 amp motor. It's a Type 21. Oh, in the back of it we have Cam B, and we'll be doing some of those decorative sew-offs, probably all of them, minus the uh, zigzag that's in position 5 during this premiere. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm glad I wrote this down. The other thing I wanted to mention is I talk a lot about the presser foot adjuster uh, that's inside of the faceplate area of these green machines. And I've always told you in the past that if you want to increase presser foot pressure, you're going to rotate that little dial that's inside of the faceplate to the rear to increase. On this Type 21, there is a nuance on it where if you want to increase presser foot pressure, you actually have to rotate that little dial to the front. And uh, that is not true of all the green machines. Apparently, they decided to mix it up and keep it real a little bit. So I wanted to mention that uh, just so you're aware of it. What else? Okay, yep, that, I think that was it. I think that's all I had on there. I didn't have a lot of notes. I just had a couple little things that I wanted to remind myself of. Because when I get into the mode of doing the premiere, I'll sometimes uh, forget to mention things. And... Uh, and then I get done with the premiere, and it's like, oh, shoot, I forgot to talk about that. So let's do, let's next do some of this uh, genuine cowhide. And I've got a pretty good-sized chunk of this stuff, so I'm just going to probably buzz around a little bit. And we'll just lay down some stitches on this. It's a single layer. It's probably about, actually, it's probably about as thick as the uh, elk hide. It's close to, I would say, four or five ounces of uh, leather and again cowhide is the stuff that the you know the old west used to use they used to make they used to make all kinds of stuff out of cowhide and uh, so and you know what I'm thinking instead of buzzing around this because I've got a lot of other sew offs to do maybe what we could do is we could lay down no, 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 we'll buzz around. We'll buzz around a little bit. You know why? Because it'll give me a chance to employ uh, John's slow gear, which was also not working when the machine arrived. And John had looked at it as well and was trying to figure things out. Well, someone prior to John having the machine decided that they were going to try to probably clean it or do something to it. They took it apart. They put it back together wrong. And that's part of the reason it wasn't working. Plus, it needed a lot of cleaning and it needed uh, some lubrication in the areas that were real dry on it as well. Again, the bobbin assembly uh, does a variety of different functions and has tiny little mechanisms in it that are, most of them are going to be spring loaded. And if any of those areas are either dry if they're supposed to be lubricated or crusted up and they're supposed to be clean, they're not going to function as they're intended to function. Okay? Yeah, that all makes sense. Okay, so what are we going to do next? Let's go ahead and buzz around this genuine cowhide a little bit. I've got the slow gear on already. I just pulled out the uh, little bobbin assembly. And let's go ahead and uh, let you listen to John's uh, machine. And we'll also kind of just buzz around and lay down some stitches on this uh, single layer of uh, genuine cowhide. All right, here we go. trying to turn it I'm trying <laughs> I was trying desperately to turn it and now I didn't have the needle down so that'll be goofy but we'll have a little bit of a gap point right there when you have a roller foot on here it's not ideal for trying to turn material it's great for pressing that material down against the uh, feed dogs but as far as turning it it is not easy in the least 
and that's the whole function that's the whole function of uh, the roller foot is it's supposed to press that material down to make it more difficult to, to turn it in for that material to move so let's head back this way I cheated and uh, I'll re-employ that uh, slow, slow gear again slow gear again blah, blah, and we'll buzz down and around again a couple more times we're probably not going to go all the way to the center or this will be a real long premiere alright here we go And I did send John just a little clip of this slow gear running on his machine and needless to say he was very very excited because he's never experienced uh, the slow gear on a Husqvarna before he's never experienced it okay so I'm, I'm gonna leave the slow gear out we'll go down and around one more time and then we'll call it quits getting pretty close to that center point anyway All right, so I'm going to lay that needle down again. We'll rotate, rotate this material, blah, 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 and uh, we will buzz down to the finish. And to buzz down to the finish, I will take the slow gear out, and we'll buzz down at, mo at a more normal rate of speed. We're not going to be going full blast, but we're going to be buzzing down a little bit faster, obviously, than the slow gear. And if you're new to this channel, if you're new to Husqvarna's, the slow gear takes that motor from full power down to one-fifth of the power. And it does that through a gear exchange ratio change inside of that bobbin assembly. And that's why that bobbin assembly is so critical to this machine that it's, uh, that it's operating exactly right. All right, down to the finish. And again, not going to be giving it pedal to the metal. I'll just give it a little bit more of a boost. All right, here we go. And I actually ended in the up position. If that's not the miracle of miracles, I don't know what is. And my thread that I picked kind of matches the machine a little bit. It's kind of a, a off green color. I'm sure that someone might give it a different uh, name of green or something like that, a different designation of green. I'm just going to call it an off green color. And so uh, against this light, uh, genuine cowhide, I'll probably have to zoom in pretty close. As a matter of fact, I'll grab some of my uh, painter's tape and maybe we can put this, uh, unless I can kind of balance it, maybe I can kind of balance it here by the edge of the machine. We'll see if that works because I know my my little uh, sew-off holder that Maddie sent me is going to be, yeah, it's not going to quite work. Not going to quite work. Maybe what I can do is I can come off the tripod so you can see these up close and personal, and then we'll uh, we'll resume uh, the sew offs right after that. Let me do that, and I'll bring my lights in a little bit as well to kind of light those up. Although indirect lighting on those stitches sometimes actually helps. It's kind of weird how lighting and angles can, and that's that's why that's why there's professional photographers of which I am not that uh, get all those right angles and everything every single time and it just their photography just looks absolutely spectacular so I'm going to show you John's machine too I'll sit down on my little stool and I'll show you his machine kind of from the front and you'll notice it does have a little bit of a two-tone appearance to it now because on some of the areas like uh, by the uh, decaling right here I couldn't get all of that varnishing off without damaging uh, the Viking uh, branding and I didn't want to do that so I left part of the two-tone appearance, and it's kind of an interesting reminder to John as well as to how the machine uh, looked. Although this in this area right here, because I, I softly cleaned it, looks a lot better than the rest of the machine had looked. Uh, and uh, it's looking pretty good now. So, All right, we'll see how close we can get to these so we can hopefully see some of the stitch definition of the uh, stitches I just, I just laid down. And that green marking you see on there, I don't know if you 
remembered me mentioning it, but I buy some of these scraps of leather from a fairly large corporation in this area north of me. And they uh, do uh, seats and stuff for uh, luxury uh, airplanes. And the, the, the scraps that I buy are ones that they don't want, that they can't use. So you'll see that markup on there sometimes where they uh, marked it to cut it. I'm just trying to catch my my bearing again. I'm looking through a little screen, so being able to see uh, all of the stitching through this little screen is nearly impossible. Well, as you can readily see, I think, as you can readily see, uh, the stitches are absolutely spot on. The formation, uh, the presentation of the stitching. Uh, even with a slightly uh, crooked roller foot <laughs> that doesn't quite fit that presser foot shank just right. And I've talked about that in other premieres where uh, you really have to be mindful of how that, uh, you know, how your attachments fit that presser foot shank. You know, if they're just a little bit off, you'll get some wonky stuff happening. So far, we've been spared of that. But uh, we're not done yet, so you never know. All right, I'm going to make you absolutely dizzy. But the reality is that the uh, stitching on this leather looks absolutely spectacular. Again, we went through a single layer of this uh, uh, genuine cowhide. But again, if you get real close to it, there's nothing thin about that at all. And this is going to have a real, real, real tough nap for us to see much of anything, quite honestly, even if I get real close to it, I'll zoom way in. Um, it's going to be really, really tough for us to see uh, any of the stitching. Yeah, it's nearly impossible. So we're going to have to go on faith as far as that lock stitch, because uh, there's no way I can hold the camera and, and pull it back at the same time. But, uh, you know, based on what I'm seeing on that top stitch, Actually, if I lay it down, maybe that'll help us too a little bit. From what I'm seeing with that top stitch, um, that lock stitch is going to be equally uh, fabulous. Yep, actually laying it down actually helped a little bit to some degree. Well, you get the idea. I'm going to give it a pass. So, so far we've done a, um, a layer of elk hide, um, a layer of uh, genuine cowhide. I'm going to get the camera back up on the uh, tripod, and we're going to keep on moving forward with additional sew-offs. And I still have to remember as well, we're going to do uh, decorative sew-offs too, so I don't want to run that spool too far down. And all of a sudden, be in a desperate position as far as uh, the uh, spool of thread inside of the machine running low. All right, let me put a little bit more music on for us. And I think I mentioned I was going to put on... Um, we already did Wandering Soul, didn't we? My screen sometimes shifts a little bit. I'll be honest, I don't remember if we did this already. I think we did. Let's go and let's do uh, Hopeful Freedom. Hopeful Freedom, I think, is one that we talked about doing next. All right, let's zoom down to uh, the needle and we'll move on to the next sew off. Got a number of things lined up that we can potentially sew. Also, I, I did, um, I'll just mention it real quick, I did quite a bit of cleanup on the chrome portions of John's machine as well. You'll see in the uh, Facebook shots that this cover for the feed dogs looked much different before I did it. And then I decided I would do the same thing uh, 
to the other chrome part, parts of the machine as well. Again, it's not absolutely perfect, uh, but the whole idea is to make things better than uh, when the machine arrived. So I think I've accomplished that. All right, let me plug this camera back in before I forget. And we have a battery that decides to take a dump on us. It's kind of a cool roller foot, isn't it? It's kind of cool. I just wish it would fit that uh, shank just a little bit better than it does. It's, it's crooked. It's crooked the way it sits there. I'm going to try this leather suede and we'll see how, how uh, John's machine does with this leather suede. And you know what I'm going to do to make my life a little bit easier? You've had a chance to see a number of sew-offs, or I should say two sew-offs, with, uh, with this uh, roller foot which is, is nice, it's kind of different. But I was gonna, yeah, I'll leave it. I was gonna switch it out with the universal one because what I wanted to do with this uh, leather suede is kind of go around the edges and it's gonna be really tough to make turns uh, with this stuff, but I'll just, I'll just put the needle down and just do it manually, that's the best way to do it. Because with a roller foot on here, it's gonna be almost impossible. It's almost impossible. All right, and I'm going to employ that slow gear again to give me a fighting chance to try to get around at least the first edge before I need to put that needle down and cheat. All right, all right, here we go. Oh, let me just check that. There we go. trying to make that turn so desperately. You see me trying to pull that material? I was trying to pull it and then pull it and pull it. I don't even think we're going to have enough room to stick that needle down. We might. We might. I'm going to give it a try anyway. The other thing with these roller uh, wheels attachments, these roller wheel attachments, is if you don't get both of those rollers on the material, you can try to launch and you'll just spin out. It'll just totally, uh, totally spin out. Yeah, I got a little bit of gap point back there where I tried to turn that material. We'll see that when we get done. Yeah, I tried to I tried to do it gently, but that's just not going to work when you're trying to pull this leather suede and you're and you're dealing with that presser foot uh, with that roller attachment on there, basically just saying, ah, no, my whole job is to keep this material from moving left or right, and you're trying to move it left and right to manipulate it around those edges, and the roller foot is just saying, ah, no, that's my job is to keep you from doing that, so I'm going to keep working hard at that because. That's what I was. That's what I was designed to do. So when we go around and look at these stitches, we'll see that little gap point there where I tried to pull it and then I stopped, and uh, it created a little bit of a gap point as far as that stitch. But oh well, it's not always perfect, especially when you're working with something like this. Yeah, this material is going to be the same as that other one where. It's going to be a little bit of a bugger to try to get it to sit up straight, but I'll give it a try. There we go. I think that'll stay long enough to at least look at the stitches, and then we'll hopefully be able to turn it around and take a look at the lock stitches. This will obviously be a lot easier to see than uh, that uh, last leather piece that we just sewed. Now, those are gorgeous stitches, folks. They just are. And again, leather suede, if you're not familiar with it, it's much trickier to sew, much trickier to sew than other types of leather because of the way it's uh, manufactured, the way it's made. It's got a slickness to it, almost like Italian leather, and it tends to manipulate uh, stitches. And I can see on here it tried to do it, but it didn't succeed on John's machine. Um, if you look real close at those stitches right there that I'm focused on, 
you'll notice if, if I stop touching the camera you'll notice you'll notice that you can just barely see the edge of that lock where the stitches join uh, starting to try to come to the surface and that's telling us that if we sewed a lot of this leather suede material we would want to increase what? Would we want to increase upper tension or would we want to reduce upper tension? Because in this case, it's, it's, it's subtle enough that we don't have to mess with the bobbin case at all. Some cases we would. So if we wanted to push that knot back down a little bit, what would we do? Increase upper tension or decrease upper tension? I'm waiting for you. I'm patient. I'll put on a little bit of music while you're thinking about that question that I just posed, and you can type it in the chat. So that last one that I played was called Hopeful Freedom. This one is called Sweetie, Sweetie My Heart. I'm not making that up. Sweetie My Heart. Okay, I think I've given you enough time, and I'm not looking at the chat, so you may have typed it a long time ago. You might be saying, Scott, we already typed it. We're good. When you can see the 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 lock basically the knot when you can see the knot that close to the surface it's still into the material but it should be a little bit further down uh, that is a product of the upper tension being too high the upper tension is muscling over the bobbin pull down and it's pulling that knot up higher to the surface than it should so what we would do in this instance if we were sewing a lot of of leather suede is we would back off that upper tension just slightly to allow that bobbin case to have the victory and to pull that knot back down. Again, the bobbin case is going to pull the knot down. If the upper tension is too strong, it's going to pull the knot up too high like it did in this case. It's still a beautiful stitch. It's a very, very good looking stitch. You can look at it and go, that's a gorgeous stitch, Scott. I don't know what you're seeing, buddy. Well, what I'm talking about is if you want to you're never maybe going to hit perfection, but if you don't aim for it, you're never going to come even close to it. So I would make a fine adjustment if we were sewing a lot of leather suede. I would back off that upper tension slightly, which would allow that bobbin to pull it down a little bit further. And then that knot that you can see right now just barely would disappear. And all you would see is a perfect top stitch, which we pretty much have already. It's real close. Some of you might be saying, gosh, I wish, I wish my stitching would look half that good. It's a real good looking stitch. I'm not going to take, see there's my little wonky thing when I went off the edge and I lifted the knee, yeah, just ignore that one. It's a very good looking stitch. So I'm going to come out on this. We can look at the totality of the stitching, as I love saying. It almost looks like a pearl necklace, doesn't it? Against that uh, darker leather suede. So let's turn it around and look at that lock stitch. Well, the problem with leather suede, too, is it acts like a little vacuum cleaner. It picks up all the lint and the other stuff that's anywhere near it. So I'm liking the look of the lock stitch. The lock stitch looks spot on, which tells me that in spite of uh, the issue with the top stitch being just a little bit too heavy, with that not coming too far up, here we've got a very, very nicely defined lock stitch. And it's partly because, there's my little wonky thing again, it's partly because, uh, again, that knot has been pulled so close to the surface on that top stitch that it is almost overemphasized uh, the lock stitch. And you might say, well, what's the problem with overemphasizing the lock stitch? What it does is it then almost strangles the, the, the lock stitch and makes it a little bit stubbier than it would be otherwise if, that, if the, uh, the stitch were tight but it wasn't stretched too far. 
because again that that upper tension right now is pulling that lock stitch up harder than it needs to be pulling it so it actually constrains there you can see it right there that little stitch right there in the middle where at that point it was yanking harder and it actually constrains uh, the formation of that stitch a little bit all, all in all we've got a real good looking stitch but um, that's the the critical factor of getting that balance between uh, the upper tension and the bobbin case is that you can get a perfect balance uh, between the lock and the top stitch and the result then is you get beautifully defined stitches as you're seeing now on camera on the lock stitch and also on the top stitch as well but they're not over defined you can actually over define a stitch too which means you're probably sacrificing the other stitch uh, just slightly that's our top stitch again which is also equally spectacular and again if you've never ever sewn leather suede before put it on your bucket list because it if you can lay down great stitches like we did here uh, with the lock and the, the top stitch and, and if you wanted to absolutely work on perfecting it if you were sewing a lot of leather suede then we know exactly what we would do we would just back that top stitch off just ever so slightly and it would pull that knot a little bit further down into the material so that we would have even a I mean it's already gorgeous but we would have a drop dead gorgeous nearly perfect top stitch to boot but again I don't want to steal I don't want to take anything away from these stitches I mean those are those are spectacular stitches but again in a classroom we're always looking to uh, improve we're always looking to uh, make things even better we're looking for constant and never-ending improvement and uh, we keep we keep raising the bar right so that's what I would recommend on this I'm gonna throw it to the rear it's a pass after that really long-winded explanation of what we would do but uh, it's okay to do that so okay okay to take a little bit of extra time and cover things and just make sure everybody's on the same sheet of music I'm trying to find that material that I sewed the last time that initially when I looked at it this stuff right here I initially looked at it and I thought gosh that looks like that looks like a leather material and I even mentioned I said yeah it's a leather material and it's got a real super flat nap see that flat nap right there even it, it even has a, a, a grain appearance to it as well so it looks like uh, genuine leather and then the beauty of having the live chat during the live premieres is a couple people chimed in and said we don't think that's actually leather we think that that's a man-made material and they named what it was and if you're in this premiere and you were in that premiere as well go and type in the chat what the name of this stuff is again because I don't know I, I'm kind of divided you know I I, I think y'all are real smart and if you say I've seen that exact material before and it's artificially made and uh, it's not real leather maybe they, maybe they use some leather in it to make it to give it that leather appearance but it's not genuine leather like the other two sew-offs that we just did actually the other three sew-offs we just did we had elk hide we had cow hide and then we had uh, leather suede those are all genuine leathers but a number of you said I think one of them was super B out of uh, Las Vegas along with another person attending a previous premiere and they said that's a real good fake for leather but that is not real leather so we're gonna sew it anyway because I'm guessing if it's not completely leather it's probably got a little bit of leather in it and it's probably got vinyl as well and vinyl is a pickle when it comes to sewing it it just is it is a pickle when it comes to sewing it but I'm not gonna sew this much I'm, and I'm not going to go in a circle again. So much to all of your relief. <laughs> I'm going to cut off a chunk of this and we're just going to buzz down it. Uh, maybe we'll even buzz down it with a zigzag. I don't know. Let me cut this off. Even I, I cut a lot of leather. You all know that. It even cuts like leather. So whoever, if this is not the genuine article, uh, boy, they did a heck of a job. They did a heck of a job. I'm going to throw this other piece to the side we'll use that another time oh I didn't show you guys something I just I just got 
I had shown you that, remember that old-fashioned iron that Mr. Bean uses as a sewing table? And I showed you guys that, and I kind of invited you all to give me information on it, tell me about it, whatever. Guess what I found? I'll come out on this, let me come all the way out on the shot so we can look at John's whole machine instead of us kind of cutting the machine off in a sense. Look what I found. And I know John's uh, older than I am, so he might even be able to tell us a little bit about this beyond what we already know. And obviously it was an iron, it, and I'm guessing that they would put it onto a stove and they would heat it up. And this banding that you see are actually zip ties holding this thing together. Uh, because the original little metal clips that were on here that attached to the top of this broke. They probably rusted through or something. But this is the original handle, the original base. They just zip tied it together so that you could actually pick it up and get a feel for how this would have been used. I mean, using something like this, it, I don't even know what it weighs, probably five pounds, you know, for ironing. You can only imagine that those, those gals or guys that used it back in the day, they were pretty buffed. I mean, this was the equivalent of, hey, pump me up, pump me up. Because that's, I mean, that's all solid. It's a little bit, there's a little bit of a hollow point on top where maybe you add some water or something like that. But uh, otherwise, holy mackerel, that sucker is heavy. But I was so excited to find the rest of it because we kind of we kind of were guessing as to what it might look like because Mr. Bean only has the lower half of it, the metal part. But I just think that is so cool. I just think it's so cool. Oh, hello, Your Majesty. All right, let's get down by the needle again with this slightly cockeyed uh, roller foot <laughs> I actually thought about giving it to John as a gift but since I know it doesn't fit the shank just right uh, I think I originally got this for a FOF machine and the shanks are are somewhat close in design but they're just different enough that you know if if I if I took the I probably should have done that when I was off the tripod before but I didn't if we were to get real close on that uh, roller foot from a straight on position you see it's just it's canted just a little bit to the left which uh, the roller the rollers themselves which are metal there's a roller in the front there's a roller in the back they're still over the feed dogs so we're not we're not you know totally toast but it's not it's not ideal either it's not ideal and again when you're launching with something like this and a roller foot while you would want to get it closer to the edge so you could get your stitch closer to the end of the material if you don't get it under both of those roller foots uh, you're in a world of hurt because it starts to bunch up and the one roller foot is against the feed dogs it's trying to roll it the other one doesn't have a grip on the material and it just creates a it creates a little bit of a mess so we'll sacrifice the end of the material and try to get a better launch on this so what what should I sew next got a single layer of this stuff that probably has some leather in it but it may not be all genuine leather we could lay down one of the decorative stitches or we could lay down a zigzag just a standard old zigzag on it I think I'll do a zigzag but I'll make it a modified zigzag so I'm gonna take my stitch width down to about two and a half and I'm gonna take my uh, stitch length and move that down to about uh, probably about just around three, three and a half, somewhere in that realm. And we'll buzz down this laying down a modified zigzag. All right, are you ready? Here we go. Yeah, I like that. It's not a true zigzag, but it's got a zigzag taste to it. All right. Get that up there and we'll look at this stuff. Even if it's not genuine leather, I don't have an issue with sewing on it because it's probably going to have some vinyl in it. And vinyl, as you know, really, really puts a, a machine to the test. So I'm always excited to sew vinyl because it it makes uh, it makes it uh, a true representation of just how well that machine is doing. If I don't break my lights in the process, 
All right, let's take a look at the this uh, modified zigzag through this single layer of this uh, leather vinyl material that's man-made, most likely. Just look at that surface, though, and that surface just says this is not an easy material to sew. Some good looking stitches, some real good looking stitches. Let's turn it over and look at that lock stitch. We should be able to see it on that flat uh, nap. I'll just call it a nap because it looks like it's has kind of a nap appearance to it, even if it's man-made. Again, they've done just a, I think they've done a stellar job of making something man-made look real, real, real. Plus, we've got the ability to see that lock stitch a lot more clearly. Absolutely spot on. That sure looks like leather, doesn't it? A number of folks that, um, or at least two people that said it probably wasn't, but what do we call it leather vinyl, Le leather vinyl mix or something. Kind of like when they make particle boards, you know. Particle boards are made out of wood, but they're not genuine wood. But if you ever tried to nail a nail in particle boards, holy mackerel. So coming out from a distance is, I mean, it doesn't do much other than show us what appears to be the nap of the material. And uh, John's machine did a, a fabulous job on this material as well. So I'm going to throw that to the back with the other leather stuff. I'll move this uh, little sew-off holder to the side. What else can we sew? I've got another material I'm pretty sure is leather, but it's not pure leather. It's got a layer of leather on it and then it's got another backing. It's going to be similar to that last stuff that we just sewed. See that? I don't have my screen facing. Probably don't have it locked either. See this stuff? Looks like the kind of stuff you would have on the old office chairs. It's probably got some leather in it as well, but then it has a different soft background on it. The backing on it is, uh, the backing of it is real soft and smooth, which means it's probably real slippery. So probably not super easy to sew, which is why we're going to do it. So again, I'm going to do a single layer of this. I'll cut it down. We'll make it a little bit smaller so we don't waste it. I'll use the rest on another sew off and we'll buzz down this as well. And we can sew this one with John's slow gear because we're just going on a straight line. So I don't have to worry about that roller foot saying, you're not going to turn. No way, buddy. It's not going to happen. All right, let me leave that right there. I'll set this other piece over in my pile of scraps that I use for sew-offs. And we'll see how John's uh, machine does. I'm all over the place. We'll see how John's machine does on this stuff. And this, again, may be a manufactured uh, type material, but I'm guessing that that Kind of like the, you know how they, they you, when you look at shoes, they have something like a leather upper, that sort of thing, where part of the shoe is leather. The rest of it, they use like a vinyl fake appearance type material on it. I think that's what we've got here. So it's probably, again, going to have vinyl in it, which is not easy to sew, which is why we're going to give it a try. So and I've never sewn this material before. I just got this. I got a, a fairly good sized chunk of it. So we're going to see how John's uh, machine does with this stuff. And I think I'll go for a, uh, should I do a zigzag on this too? We did a zigzag on the other one. We might as well just stay on the zigzag, right? But we'll use our slow gear on this one. So I'm going to pull out John's slow gear and we'll see how his machine does with this stuff, which may be partly vinyl, partly leather. It's hard to tell. They, they, they do such a good job of faking it, don't they? All right, here we go.
Can you see the benefit of that slow gear as we're going down that material? And it's doing just a spectacular job of harnessing the power of that 1.5 amp motor. I mean, that's one of the, even though it's a Westinghouse motor, and I've talked about this in other premieres, the Husqvarna Viking Sewing Machine Company likely had a vetting process that vet, a vetting process blah, a vetting process that far surpasses anything that a governmental type agency would do as a private uh, company and i bet you they had requirements of the westinghouse company in how they produce that motor and qas and checks and rechecks and everything else that would have just been been crazy it would have been literally crazy in uh, how they uh, ran the free Westinghouse people through the, uh, you know, through the ringer, basically, and saying this is this is our standard. It can't be less. It can't be you know anything deviating from that. It's got to be exactly the way that we want it. What did Free Westinghouse say with a contract of that size? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. We'll do that. We'll do that right away. So here again is this material which may have some leather in it, it may have some vinyl in it, may have leather and vinyl in it, but nonetheless it is not an easy material to sew. And yet John's machine, well, you can see it. If I stay on course you can see it. <laughs> Just did a fabulous job. This is real tricky stuff to sew by the way if you don't. You don't, if you're not familiar with vinyl, if you're not familiar with leather vinyl blends, which is probably what this is, leather a leather vinyl blend with a real slick back, backing on it. Not easy in the least. Not even a single layer of this stuff is easy because it's probably about three ounces of this leather vinyl type blend. I come out come out on that we can look at the totality of the stitching and I made some longer pieces today so it's kind of a little bit more challenging to see the totality of the stitching isn't it but isn't that gorgeous didn't John's machine do a fabulous job and again if it's a leather vinyl blend the piercing threshold of that when you incorporate that vinyl into it especially with that additional slippery uh, backing on it uh, you're really setting yourself up for a challenge as far as uh, stitch uh, distortion. But I'm liking this stuff a lot. Look at how that lock stitch presents on this type of material with that backing, that gray backing that they give you. You can really, really see those lock stitches well defined. Just absolutely spot on, absolutely spot on. And you know, just based on the um, almost the grid kind of showing through there, uh, this is something that would be used in upholstery, obviously. Davenports, chairs, maybe even couches. And I bet you it's pretty durable stuff too. Especially if it has that vinyl in there, as I suspect. So look at it from a distance. I'll, I won't, I'll try not to go too far out, but I, I kind of have to because of the size uh, of that uh, sew-off piece. But that's just an absolutely gorgeous lock stitch as well. Again, a single layer of this vinyl leather blend. Uh, and John's machine just did a spectacular job. So I'm going to throw that to the rear uh, as well as a definite success. I'm very pleased with that. Now I've got a new material I haven't used ever before, and I'm almost a little bit nervous to use it. I'm going to set it by the king for right now and say that I'm going to use it, and I probably will, but not right away. I'm going to shake that one off a little bit. So what I'm going to do next is some of this commercial grade uh, vinyl. And let me change my camera angle before I forget, and you have to watch it by watching it afterwards. So we'll come up a little bit come in on our crooked uh, roller foot which has been doing amazingly well so far considering 
You know what I mean? Considering. But I probably won't use it again on a Husqvarna because it's just not, it's not fitting that shank right. All right, let me put a little bit more music on so I'll hopefully talk less. And we'll get through this premiere eventually. This next one is called Allegro. Allegro. Here we go. On some of these other ones that are coming up, I can kind of see them. Uh, we've heard a number of these before. <clears throat> All right. So let's do this commercial grade uh, canvas. I got this weird, weird little curly thing right on the edge here. I'm almost tempted to cut that off, but that roller foot will press that down nice and nice and easy when we get to that point, hopefully. So we're starting with two layers, right? I'm going to go ahead and fold it uh, over once. We get us up to uh, four layers. Kind of deciding how I want to do this. When I fold it again, it's going to get us up to, uh, to six layers. Let me shorten this just a little bit. I want to try eight layers, even though this stuff is crazy, crazy tough. So four layers, six layers, eight layers. I'm pretty close. If, if I go down the middle, see how I folded that a little bit short? Just a little bit short, but if I go right down the middle, we'll hit all of those eight layers. I'm even going to stretch it a little bit. All right, so this is what we're going to attempt. I get that stuff off of there. I know. It's insane. It's absolutely, are you out of your mind, Scott? Yeah, a little bit, but that's okay. It makes for a more fun classroom, doesn't it? So I'm going to slide that into position. Hopefully I can fit it underneath this roller foot because that is the thick of the thick of the thick. There we go. Get that roller foot down on top of that, pressing that into the feed dogs, and I'm hoping we'll be able to buzz down this successfully, although I'll be honest with you, we'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait and see. I think the last time I used this commercial grade uh, canvas, I only went six layers, so I'm going two layers higher on John's Type 21 with that 1.5 amp free Westinghouse motor. So we'll have to see. We'll have to see. Maybe I maybe I bit off more than I can chew. And if that's the case, uh, then I'll step it back. Let me just take a look back here. Rick. I'll step it back to uh, six layers, and we'll just march on forward. And that's okay. That's okay. Sometimes in the classroom, you change the lesson, lesson plan. Our lesson plan right now is to see how John's machine does with eight layers of commercial-grade canvas. But if that doesn't work, we'll change the lesson plan, and we'll go back to six. But I gotta try it. I just gotta try it. You know what I mean? So now I'm deciding what I want to lay down on it. We did a zigzag a couple times already. We can go back to a straight stitch. That certainly is an option to us. Lay down a straight stitch. We could even lay down a shorter straight stitch so that we're really making the intensity of that hook movement in the raceway really have to attack that fast and furious. Now that might, when we go that short, it might result in some skip stitches. So I'm just saying that in advance. If we, if we don't get any skip stitches, then I will be absolutely elated because eight layers of canvas, sewing a stitch that's a little bit shorter, we're really, really pushing John's machine to the limits. Now yes, I did all the motor work. Yes, I reworked uh, and cleaned and uh, re, how would I say this? I reassembled the bobbin winding assembly correctly. I rewired the machine with a new power cord and all of that, but this still may be a little bit too much for uh, John's Type 21. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. I have no idea. And then the question is, do I do it a slow gear or do I do it full speed? I'm going to go slow gear. Let's go slow gear on this and just see how John's machine does. This is not going to be easy, folks. This is not going to be easy. I'm a little bit nervous. A little bit nervous. Eight layers of heavy grade, commercial grade, I should say, uh, canvas. Here we go. Keep your fingers crossed. Keep your fingers crossed. Whew. Here we go. Yeah, that is really, that is really putting this thing, you hear it struggle a little bit? 
Of course, I didn't have my foot all the way on the foot controller either, which doesn't help the cause very much. Holy mackerel. We actually did it, folks. We actually did it. We actually, we actually did it. Oh my gosh. Hold on a second. Let me move this back up there. Stay there. Stay there. Stay there. Holy mackerel. I shouldn't be impressed. I spent a lot of time on John's machine, but still, it's impressive. Eight layers of this commercial grade canvas. Absolutely unbelievable. But you know what I'm going to do real quick? I'm going to sew it again. Not because I'm crazy, but because I'm noticing that that lock stitch, let's see if I'm seeing that right. Yeah, the lock stitch doesn't look bad. It actually looks really good. Maybe I won't sew it again. At any rate, this is what we just went through, folks. Eight layers of commercial grade canvas. So I'm going to show you the stitch first, and then I'm going to contemplate it a little bit more if I'm going to try it one more time, because I don't want to push my luck either, if you know what I mean. So here is our top stitch, I'm kind of bending this back a little bit so we can get it to set nicely. See how that's a little, it's almost like a cowlick on the back of there, so it's trying to push it off of this. Yeah, that's not going to work, it keeps trying to push it off of there. Maybe I can lean it like this. Maybe that'll work. Yeah, that'll work. So I kind of have it leaning against Maddie's uh, sew-off holder and resting on that little place setting thing that I have there now underneath the machine. Let's go down there and look at this. And again, I did set that stitch length down just a little bit to make it even more difficult. And again, if you see the line kind of wavy a little bit that's not that I didn't sew it straight although it might be it's more likely that again that roller foot is pushing this material uh, to the left a little bit because it's not squarely centered on that uh, presser foot shank but those are gorgeous stitches spacing the formation Holy mackerel. I don't even look at that. It's almost terrifying. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous stitching. Again, we're talking eight layers of commercial grade canvas, folks. Let's look at, look at the uh, totality of the stitching. I can actually bring it in a little bit because I didn't saw all the way to the end. That is impressive. That is very impressive. Let's look at the lock stitch. Let's try to look at the lock stitch. See that thing is it, it's popping up. I'm going to cut that off because that's irritating me. Hold on a second. We'll cut that little tail off so that it can't continue curling up like that any longer. Over the garbage can. Two points. There we go. I'm going to still move it down a little bit lower. That might work. Again, when you're doing this on a live premiere and you're doing it in front of the camera, what you might think from your, you know, your chair, your couch, wherever you're watching this premiere, boy, that, that should be a lot easier than that. It's not, trust me. If you've ever been on camera, it changes every dynamic about you doing basic things like blowing your nose. And I've been doing this a long time. Not necessarily slowing machines, but blowing my nose. I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't laugh and hold the camera. It's not going to work. So this is our lock stitch. And uh, those stitches are spot on. Again, I might increase that upper tension just slightly to tweak them a little bit. But all in all, they're coming through very nicely. And again, we're talking about eight layers of commercial grade canvas folks not easy in the least especially when you have a roller foot that's cockeyed to the left but I'm not gonna make excuses I'm gonna say that I'm very pleased with that lock stitch we didn't have a single missed stitch going through this many layers of commercial grade canvas eight layers 
So I think we had an absolute success. And again, look at that. I've got to turn my camera around here. Look at that from the side. Where am I? Oh, there I am. Look at that from the side. I've said it before, that's like a Chicago phone book or something. Great stitching uh, on both sides. Let me come down here because I'm way off course here. Beautiful top stitch. Beautiful lock stitch. It's a definite pass. I'm going to throw it to the back. Throw it to the back. Let's move on. So I, I see what I'm going to have to do, because I think originally when I cut that canvas that we just sewed, that commercial grade canvas, I was thinking of using it uh, basically as two layers and doing the decorative stitches on that piece. So guess what I have to do real quick, as I put on some more music to you listen to. For you to listen to, blah, we'll come on in this shot on uh, John's uh, Type 21 and move that light back which keeps dropping down I think my spring is going out on it or something put on a little bit of music and we will go on to the next sew off hold on a second that's the wrong window there it is okay this silly thing keeps recalibrating, which is why I keep playing, or potentially playing the same song over and over again, because it keeps shifting it. So this one I know I haven't played yet on this premiere, number nine, Esther's Waltz. As I cut some more material, because I use the material for the eight layers, the, the eight layer sew off for the commercial grade canvas, which is fine. I'll just cut another piece. going to be doing the stitches on cam B which is basically four decorative stitches and then a zigzag so I think I don't I won't need a huge piece of material I don't think I will yeah I shouldn't need I think I actually cut it longer than I just needed to but that's okay We'll look at it visibly, visually, visibly, visibly, visually. Oh, I wish I could untie my tongue. Okay, so there we go. We got another piece right there we can use for the saw offs, and it's probably going to give us more space than we actually need because I only have the one cam that John sent with the machine, which is uh, Cam B. And you saw that sewed off recently on uh, a Nets machine. It's going to be the same stitches. But I'm not using that fancy chrome needle. I'm not using that fancy chrome needle, so they may they may look different on John's machine. I'm using a slightly different uh, thread as well. I'm not using my Americana Quilters thread. I'm using Coates and Clark thread as well. So the stitches will probably present a little bit differently because we have different a different needle. We have different thread. We have a different machine. So let me get that into place so I can judge how far I'm out and if I need to adjust that camera in a little bit more, I probably do. And now we're going to move into the phase of doing the uh, decorative stitches on John's machine on Cam B. Let me get this underneath that squirrely little presser foot with that roller foot in place. Yeah, I could just sew these slightly on, a, on an angle to the left and then they would be real straight. I might just do that. Yeah, I got the material a little bit to the left. Cant it a little bit to the left so that I can uh, hopefully use that presser foot more effectively since it's not lined up correctly. Boy, that was such a short song, wasn't it? Esther's Waltz is not a long song. 
You're not going to be waltzing very long, by the way, folks. You're not going to be waltzing long. So number seven, Alone With My Thoughts, is the next one. I'm not making that title up. Number seven, Alone With My Thoughts. And I've got it soft enough. I don't think it's going to interrupt you being able to hear John's machine running at all. It's real soft. And you know what I should do for everyone's benefit? Come out on this shot so you can see me making the changes to get that decorative so off. Kind of come out right about to there, I think. So we've got to make a couple of changes, obviously. First of all, and I'll go from left to right, we've got our slider. Do I have that locked? Yes, I do. Uh, we've got our slider right here. And the first thing we have to do is we have to move that from uh, five to four. Otherwise, we're going we're gonna to lay down a zigzag, which we've already done a couple of times. So I'm already zeroed out on, uh, I'm, I've already got the stitch width. And I didn't cover that either in this. I probably should real quick. Let me rewind. On John's machine, the control center right here is stitch width, which has a setting of zero to four. We've got our feed dog drop right here. We've got our stitch length and reverse. And uh, the stitch length is going to give you a range of basically zero to four, just like the stitch width. And then if you move the control all the way up, if you move this lever all the way up, you're going to be sewing in reverse. And then we've got this control center right here, which gives you needle position if you turn the black portion of the knob. And then we've got this slider right here, which you can slide all the way out uh, to go to uh, stitch one or in increments from the body of the machine, basically five, four, three, two, one. Just slide this out. But each time you go to slide it, you want to zero out the stitch width to release that mechanism so you can move it without forcing it. So I'm already down in zero, so it should move, and it did, to position four very nicely. So now I need to move our stitch width to four. And again, make sure your needle is clear of the material when you're making any of these changes. And then we have to move our stitch length from four all the way down to between one and zero for our decorative output. Move it way down there. Just don't want to move it too far. The material is not even going to move, basically. I think that's pretty close. I think that's going to get us close to the finish line. So the first thing I'm going to sew on these two layers of commercial grade canvas. I'm not sewing a light cotton here, folks. I'm sewing through two layers of commercial grade canvas because I really like, I like the firmness factor of it. It's almost like having material and stiffener <clears throat> material and stiffener in one when you're sewing these two layers of canvas. So that's that's why I like to use it for the decorative stitches. Uh, and I, hopefully we can see the green against the blue. The thread is kind of a almost like a minty green and uh, kind of like the machine. And hopefully we're going to be able to see it presenting on here okay. So again, the changes that we made is we started left to right, we, we moved our slider from five to four, because five is on, on all of the cams for the Husqvarna green machines. Position five is always gonna give you a zigzag, which we're not, we don't wanna do that right now. So we moved it to four. Our needle position can stay in the middle, that's fine. We moved our stitch length from four all the way down to right between one and zero. I mean, it's way, way down there. If we were sewing a straight stitch, we'd be in the satin range. We'd be right around 20 to 30 stitches per inch. So it's it's super fine. And then we moved our uh, our stitch uh, width was on zero because we just did a straight stitch. We moved it back over to four. We're not going to do a thing with our feed dogs. Okay, does that all make sense? I think it does. We've covered this a lot of times with different Swedish beauties, and we even just covered it recently with uh, Annette's as well, her CI21A. So let's head down to the needle and see what John's machine does with this real wonky uh, roller foot laying down decorative stitching. And I should also mention the size of the needle I'm using. I've never used this size needle before with decorative sew off so it'll be interesting to see how it does. It's a size 110. 110 is huge! Which equates to a size 18. 
So I'm using a size 18 needle to do decorative, intricate sewing with a heck of a lot of needle swing. So we'll see. Like I said, it's going to present differently than when we, when we sew it on a nets. On a nets, we use that, uh, that chrome needle, which is a size 100. So this is even a bigger needle than that chrome needle we used in the last premiere for a nets CI 21A. All right. Hey, we push the limits here. We do, don't we? We'll see how we we'll see how it does. We'll see how John's. I'm sure John's machine will do fine, but my choice of threads in relation to needles and everything else it leaves a little bit to desire sometimes. But maybe that just evidences my level of confidence in how well that machine is performing, and that it will it will give me forgiveness for using a needle that is way way too big for this application. All right, here we go. Uh, we're sewing uh, stitch number four on cam B on John Smith's Type 21. Again, powered by a 1.5 amp free Westinghouse motor. Here we go. After I get my ticket arm all the way up, here we go. And we're going to do this regular speed. Here we go. It in the down position. I was hoping for the up position. Oh, that's okay. That is a pretty stitch, isn't it? You've seen this before, and you can actually see it right now, and I can't because I have the camera screen facing the wrong way. And I'm not going to dwell on this. We're going to jump into all the other decorative sew-offs as well, and I'll show you all these in the end. That is a pretty, pretty stitch. I'll show it to you now anyway. Isn't that fun? Oh, I'm touching, I'm running out of, I haven't cut the uh, the uh, thread from the uh, machine yet, so I'm like, why did, why did it stop? It's like an anchor. It's like, no, you're not going any further, buddy. You're not going any further. Now I can go as far as I want. <laughs> See? And for sewing with a size 110 needle, that's really, really, really impressive. That's really impressive. Let's move on to the next uh, stitch. And we'll see if John's machine continues to perform as well as it has through all of these sew-offs. It's just done a spectacular job. And when, again, when it, when it arrived at the workshop, when his Swedish beauty got here, it wasn't even sewing. It wasn't sewing at all. Because it had a major uh, motor issue going on with it. All right, let's do this next one. And I don't have to make it too scrunched because i got a huge piece of material here. So now we're going to be taking our stitch width down to zero to recalibrate that mechanism to allow that cam slider, the little silver slider, to move to stitch number three without you having to battle it. Now I'm going to move my stitch width back to four. Our stitch length is going to stay exactly where it's at, right around uh, between one and, uh, it's probably close to 0.5 very close to 0.5 on this uh, type 21. All right, here goes our next stitch off, which again is stitch number three on cam B. All right, here we go. And I'm not even hardly down on the foot controller. I'm just kind of just kind of cruising along, just cruising along. In the up position. Oh, that's a victory. That's a victory. Okay, it's our little pine cone thingy stitch. That's the official name, too. Our pine cone thingy stitch. Again, with a size 110 needle, these uh, stitches will not be nearly as defined if I were to step it back to a smaller, finer needle, probably in the 70 to 80 size range. 70 to 80 size range. 
All right, let's move on to that next stitch. I still like this one. Even sewing with a, a needle of this size, both of these uh, stitch offs. Oh, I'm running into the machine. I'm looking over my shoulder and running into the machine. Yeah, yeah, those are awesome. Those are awesome. Imagine if you sewed it with a needle that was more appropriate for doing decorative ornamental type sewing. But we don't always follow the rules in the classroom. We just don't. We're rebels. We don't always follow the rules. All right, so the next stitch I'm going to do off of cam B is going to be stitch uh, number two. But I've got to zero out the stitch width first, then move my little slider, take the stitch width back up to four. And again, whenever you're making changes like this, you always, always, always make sure your needle is clear of the material. Okay? Always make sure it's clear because you're going to see that needle is moving around as you're making those changes. All right, so here is stitch number two on cam B on John Smith's Type 21 powered by a 1.5 amp free Westinghouse motor. Shebang! position again. Oh boy. Yeah. Scott's in the house. Isn't that pretty? This is our little snaky one. This is our little snaky pattern. And if you saw the recent premiere on Sherry's new home machine, all mechanical new home machine, I'm trying to remember the number, it's like SL2022 or something like that. Uh, I make it a point of highlighting that New Home eventually evolved or was absorbed or transformed or something like that into Janome. And the word Janome translates to being Eye of the Snake. So we just, we just sewed the snake minus the eye. Or maybe the eye is in there, I don't know. We'd have to look at it real close. Well, let me show you this uh, stitch as well once I get this material kind of not curling. There we go. So the one on the far right is the one that we just sewed. I have to reverse it because when I look at my little screen it's actually the one on the far left. But it's the one on the far right that we just sewed. Aren't those beautiful? John's machine not only sews up a storm now, but it lays down, even with a size 110 needle, it lays down some gorgeous cam-generated decorative stitching. And if John wants to replicate these using a size 70 or 80 needle and send them to me, send pics to me, uh, I'll post them on Facebook. Because I can guarantee they're going to look a lot sharper than these, and these are super sharp as far as their appearance. Yeah, yeah, I like that. All right, let's go on to the last stitch on cam B in John's machine. And we'll see how this stitch uh, presents. This is going to be uh, stitch number one on uh, cam B. So I'm going to take the stitch width down to zero move the slider to the final position in position one on that little silver slider take our stitch width back to four and we're ready to lay down this final stitch off of cam B on uh, John Smith's uh, machine. I'm just going to make a little adjustment and move that fabric back just a little bit further because I'm seeing I went a little bit too far forward. There we go we got so much material. I mean, I don't have to squunch it, but I'm used to squunching it. So, All right, here we go. Final stitch on John Smith's Type 21. Again, this is stitch number one on Cam B. Here we go. Oh, 
I bet you I'm too short for this type of stitch. So here's what I'm going to do real quick. I'm going to rotate my needle up. Sometimes that happens. Some stitches you can push that stitch length tolerance way, 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 way down. Others you're going to have to adjust it up just slightly, otherwise you're not going to get material movement. So we're going to have a little weird thing at the beginning of this, but it should be okay uh, now that I've adjusted that stitch length down a little bit so we're not pushing it quite as far. Let's see what happens. Here we go. And I just barely moved it, but that was just just a little bit too far in that stitch length for this particular stitch. And the needle's in the up position. And I'm going to sew that row just one more time just because we're going to have that weird little track at the beginning because I had the stitch length a little bit too low for this uh, particular stitch pattern. This stitch pattern is very, very demanding and very tight. Uh, let me just clip that thread again real quick. And I'll show you what I'm talking about when you look at it. It's like, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. So you can't always leave that stitch uh, length uh, in the same position for all the cam generated stitches. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit too... There we go. I'm looking over my shoulder now. So the last stitch we just did is this one on the far right. And you can see our little spin out here at the beginning because that material was just not moving because of how intricate that, uh, that particular cam generated stitch is. But once I made that just subtle little adjustment, I just made it a little bit longer. I mean, barely longer at all. And then all of a sudden it said, okay, I got this. I got this. Beautiful stitch. We're going to do it one more time because I want to have a perfect stitch line or near perfect stitch line that I can send with this machine. I always send these stitch offs with the machine to the customer. So as they look at that premiere, and they and most often an owner will watch that premiere multiple times because it's just kind of cool to see your machine on the big screen or to see it on your iPad or whatever it is and to revisit just how well that machine did. We don't want to leave this stitch line nearly perfect, but it's got that little skid out at the, at the beginning. We're going to give John a perfect stitch line all the way down now that we have that uh, that stitch length at the sweet spot for this stitch pattern. All right, here we go. And the needle's in the up position, thank you. There we go. Now we've got a stitch line that is absolutely as it should be. And even that other stitch line that had that little skid at the, at the beginning of it because the material wasn't moving, that's still gorgeous too. That's absolutely gorgeous. Okay, so, looking over my shoulder. Yeah, we'll have to come on in this shot a little bit. Now I'm going to trim off that extra material on the bottom just because it'll sit on that uh, stitch off holder a lot easier if I do that. Let me come out on the shot a little bit and, uh, and then I'll do that quick trim and then we'll come back in on the stitches again. Again, I just, I just think it's fun to look at John's machine and we're going to pop over to Facebook real quick and you, you, if you haven't seen those Facebook shots, if you're uh, you know, only a YouTuber, uh, I think you'll be pretty impressed at uh, the transformation of John's Swedish beauty from what I would almost call kind of oogly. Oogly, as I explained to John, is something my favorite uncle, Uncle Al, would always say when he was describing something that was pretty, but it was kind of ugly too. And that's kind of how I would have described John's machine when it arrived. It was still pretty. It's a Swedish beauty. You can't take that away from the machine. But it was also a little bit ugly too just because the patina and the finish was just so rough and so potted and just was really it wasn't pleasant to look at. But she sure is pleasant to look at now, isn't she? So let me just trim this uh, material off a little bit.
and we'll set this on uh, Maddie's uh, thread holder that she sent me. Maddie should have to pay me like a nickel every time I mention her name with these thread things because she's going to be like, uh, from this point forward, unless I stop using them, which you never know, uh, she's going to be like as well known as Scott or Bill or Hans. It'll be like, well, who's this Maddie girl? Who's this Maddie chick? She's a chick from Florida. And see that? It's going to be a little bit too high profile. It kind of tips over. So we got to cheat and move it up here against the machine so the machine can kind of support it a little bit. It's the only downfall of these is what I might end up doing with these is I might end up drilling two little holes. And you know those little pot sticker uh, pokey things that you can put like shish kebabs on and all that? I might drill one, two, three holes, put some of those little shish, shish kebab thingies in there that you can also use them for marshmallows, and then it'll have a backstop where when the material's higher like this, it'll support it. And then Maddie and I'll start, start selling these things all over the world to people that want to have a way to display their stitch-offs. I don't know that we'll sell very many of them, but somebody might buy one. You never know. I don't think we should bet the farm on it, but... Maybe we should bet the farm on it. All right. A little bit more music since we're pretty much at the finish line. Almost. Yeah, there it went, rebooting again. So I have to figure out, okay, what did we already play? I think I know. I think the last one we played is number seven, Alone With My Thoughts. So now we're going to do number two, Remembering Her. Remembering Her. The girl from high school, maybe. Who knows? I'm going to turn this up a little bit so we can listen to this one. It sounds pretty. Yeah, the angle isn't quite right on. Yeah, okay, I'm coming off the tripod. I'm looking at the angle and we're going to be, kind of be able to see them, but it's going to be a little bit off. So let's come off the tripod and shoot this straight on. And I can kind of adjust this so that it's facing us straight on. And also show you that that uh, roller foot. Can you imagine that we did as well as we did, considering? And it's only because the roller foot is so wide. But you see how when you face it straight on, there we go. It's just a little bit to the left, and that's a result of this presser foot shank having a contour to it that it's pushing it to the left. Even when I loosened it a little bit, and I tried to bring it back to the right. It just doesn't, uh, it doesn't line up once you tighten it up. So this won't go with the machine. Uh, originally I thought about giving it to John, but it's, it's not going to work for him, unfortunately. Okay, back to the stitches. So the first stitch that we did, which was stitch number four on cam B, was this row on top right here. So let's go past those again. Then we did stitch number three on cam B, which is this one right below here. I call it kind of the uh, pine cone stitch. Then we just did stitch number two, which is this snaky pattern here. Again, think about how fine you could get this if you had a needle that was smaller than a 110. And we have stitch number two, which is this one right here which we, wait, that's stitch number one. Yeah, because we didn't do stitch five, so that's four, three, two, one, and we did it twice because we had that little spin out there where if your stitch length is too short, the material doesn't move, and that's what it looks like right there. Yeah. So we did one perfect row and one less than perfect row. But it's still a beautiful stitch, and if you look at those in totality, the top one being stitch number four, then stitch three, stitch two, and then stitch one twice, um, that cam B is a pretty doggone cool cam for this Swedish beauty. Isn't it? I like it. If we turn it around, are we going to see anything shockingly different? Uh, no, we're just going to see the lock stitch, which is going to be absolutely spot on. We'll look at the first stitch on top that we did, which is the lock stitch for uh, stitch number four on cam B. 
stitch number three. Zoom in on it a little bit so you're not seeing all kinds of stitches at the same time. Stitch number two. And stitch number one that we did twice. So if we come out on this and we look at all the stitches together, again, taking into account that we, two things. Take this into account. Number one, we're using a different thread than we used on Annette's uh, CI21A. On hers, we used the uh, thread that I bought at Joanne Fabrics, the Americana Quilting Thread. On this one, we're using Coates and Clark Thread. And in fact, it's this thread right here. So, different thread, different needle. On Annette's again, her Swedish Beauty that we just premiered, we used that fancy chrome size 100. On this one, we're using a general purpose type needle, general purpose type needle, and it's a size 110. I've never used a 110 before, and I knew I was going to be doing this cam stitching. I thought, I like to push the boundaries. I'm really going to push and see if this machine is performing well enough that it can lay down decent looking decorative stitches with a 110 size needle. Unheard of. Absolutely insane. And you know what the result is it did. John's machine did an absolutely spot on job as you can see in that shot. And this again is the lock stitch. We turn around, this is the top stitch. And uh, John's machine did a fabulous job. It just did a fabulous job. So I would call that a definite pass as well. All of Cam B we sewed, minus the zigzag. And uh, John's revitalized, renewed uh, Type 21. Again, with that 1.5 amp free Westinghouse uh, motor. It's not a Swedish motor in this machine. It's the free Westinghouse 1.5 amp motor. And that motor has plenty of power and uh, performed beautifully during the course of this premiere. I'm very, very pleased. Very pleased. Yeah. So, I mean, that's it in a nutshell. I had a couple of other sew-offs we could have done, but I think we've done enough. I truly do. I think, I think we covered the bases on this. I'm going to move this uh, thread holder out of the way. And I'm going to pause. Uh, actually, I'm not going to pause yet. Hold on a second. Oh, I should show you this workbench. I'm finishing up Tony's 1591 right now on the other workbench. Kind of busy here right now. So we'll focus on Tony's 1591 real quick, which as you can see from this pile, it's going to have quite a bit of rewiring, kind of like his 201. And uh, this will be a machine that's premiered very, very soon. And it just recycled again. Oh, and we still have to go to Facebook. You thought I forgot. Uh-huh. All right, number six in my dreams is the next one I'm going to put on. Number six in my dreams. Yeah, Tony again is out of Ohio. I don't know if you remember him. He originally sent me a Spartan, and I did such a great job on that machine and gave it uh, just a rebirth as far as power. He goes, I want you to do the same thing to my 201, and then eventually he sent me this 1591. And so this will be the final machine that I have of Tony's right now that I'm going to finish up for him. Uh, that's going to get quite a bit of rewiring. I've already done the foot controller. I've got to do the machine now. And then go through and do all of my finalization process on it. So that'll be fun. Kind of a melancholy mix thing where this will be the last machine I have of Tony's. But who knows? Maybe Tony will send me more machines. That would be cool. Okay. What was I going to do? Yeah, let's not do that yet. I was going to... That's Hank. You guys know Hank. He's upset about something. All right, let's go back up on the tripod and we'll look at these Facebook shots. I've got three sets of Facebook shots I want to show you. And then we'll close out, last but not least, uh, with uh, John's uh, machine. I should say his Swedish beauty. All right, let's zoom in on this.
Okay, let's do the first, let's look at that first set. And I hope that this hasn't been sitting so long that it doesn't advance. So here you can see I've taken the bottom of John's machine off because some of the things I needed to go after on his machine require that level of access. So I took the bottom of his machine off and also you can see the motor cover off as well and there's a number of other parts off screen that you can't quite see. And there's John's motor and bobbin winding assembly in the same shot. And uh, the motor needed a number of things, um, as you'll see. But also, the wires coming off of it had to be dealt with because there were basically down at the bottom of here, there were two bare wires that were either going to touch each other or they were going to touch the casing. And then if the casing is making any contact with the body of the machine, uh, John could have gotten a pretty good shock out of that. So uh, a lot of rewiring, motor cleaning, motor restoration, bobbin winding cleaning, bobbin winding restoration. It was a fairly good sized project. There you can see a closer shot of the bobbin winding assembly. And when you look at it like that, you can just see all of the potential moving parts and it really opens your eyes up to the level of servicing. If you're gonna have that component, that's an integral part of this machine again it's going to control the flow of power from the motor it's going to control the flow of power up to the main shaft that goes over the balance wheel it's going to control the slow gear it's going to control the function of disengaging the clutch all of those different things in that one little component everything has to be working just right and some parts have to be lubricated some parts have to be stripped of all of the, the junk that builds up on them again this is real close to the motor so it's going to get all of the stuff sticking to it just like the motor does because that motor is going to suck all the stuff in like a vacuum cleaner. Here I think I'm just showing you some of the little pieces of part of one of the belts that I found uh, in that area. Here we're looking at that uh, bobbin assembly real close. And I think I'm showing you the quality of the belt. Uh, the belt needed, both of his belts needed to be replaced. The short one that goes between the bobbin winding assembly and the motor and the long belt that goes over the balance wheel comes back down to that bobbin winding assembly. And this has to be adjusted in a very particular way as well to maximize power and to reduce the likelihood of, of getting slippage at launch. So there's quite a few adjustments that have to be done on that bobbin winding assembly. Here I'm just showing you again a different shot of the bobbin winding assembly. It was real filthy to say the least. And also like I said, I think I said earlier, whoever had taken it out at some point, John said he didn't so I, I believe him. Somebody else before him took it out. They, they tried to disassemble it for whatever reason, maybe to, because it wasn't working. And when they put it back together, uh, it wasn't working either because they assembled it incorrectly. Plus, it was filthy, so I don't know why they took it. I have no idea. Here again, I'm just showing you the shot of the motor. The motor has a real tight space when you're trying to take it off of this mounting back bracket. And the only way to get it off is to use what's called an offset screwdriver. If you're not familiar with an offset screwdriver, see if I can find one real quick and I'll show you. Although you will see it in the shots too. This is, uh, this is an offset screwdriver. Let me see if I can... Turn the screen around so I can actually see what you're seeing. This is called an offset screwdriver. It almost looks like it's been bent or broken, doesn't it? But it's designed to be like that. So when you go into a tight space, you can, uh, you can angle it like this. You can slide it in and you can turn that screw, uh, sort of, because this is a little bit of a bulkier offset screwdriver. But you can turn that screw in that tight space because between that, uh, that cleated belt and where that screw needs to come out is only a matter of millimeters. It's real tight in there. Real, real tight space. So there you're able to see a little bit of the uh, patina and it, and it gives the machine more of a uh, brownish green look than it actually is but you can see if I kind of go around a little bit you can just see all the potting marks and just it's nasty looking
real rough appearance on the patina. If we just pop over to the workbench real quick, you can compare it to that. That's the after. And that's the before. And again, you wouldn't get that in, at a normal service center if you went to a, a, a place to get your machine serviced. And you said, you see all that gunk and how it's pitted into the paint and, the, and it's just basically the surface looks nasty. Can you fix that? They'd show you the door pretty quick. I'm quite confident they would. Or they'd quote you a price that was so ridiculous you'd be like, oh, heck no, I can't do that. So here you can see how busy that workbench gets. I've got the head, part of the head of the machine towards, towards the uh, top of the screen. I've got the bottom of the Husqvarna towards the bottom left, the motor cover, and I've got all kinds of tools out because each step of the process, why they don't make it uniform, they can't because of the design of the machine, but each uh, process step requires a different tool. Plus I've got my handy dandy little flashlight down there as well, which helps me out a lot, this little flashlight right there. Is that it? Or is it just real slow? Did the inter Maybe the internet went out. Well, I guess that's it. So that's the last shot in that series. Now we'll go to the next series. Actually, I should probably close that first series so I don't eat up all the whatever on my computer, the RAM or whatever it is. So these are inside of the foot controller. I had to kind of beg, bar bargain, and steal because I'm getting low on foot controllers. So I had to kind of rebuild a foot controller because... As you'll see in some of the shots, John had a debunked foot controller that looked like it just was not up to the job. And it's interesting that what I zoomed in on here, it's kind of cool, is you can see I've talked before about it's so critical that your foot controller be higher rated than your motor. And in order to allow for that influx of electricity, because the electricity has to pass through the foot controller before it hits the motor. It doesn't hit the motor, then the foot controller. It hits the foot controller, then it goes into the motor. So you can see they've got uh, capacitors in here that will allow a spike. And this is crazy. They will allow a spike as high as, what does that number say? It's kind of worn down. It's either 1,300 or 1,500 volts. 1,000 something volts is how, how high that capacitor, there's actually two of them in that foot controller, will allow the influx of that electricity. So it just it, it goes back to the point again that if you have a Swedish Beauty with a 1.5 amp motor, whether it's a free Westinghouse motor or whether it's an original Swedish motor, when you're pulling that many amps, the volts can spike up dramatically as that electricity is passing from the power cord through that foot controller and eventually into that motor. And that's why they have these safeguards in there to protect uh, when that spike inevitably occurs. Again, I described it as kind of like a dam. You know, when you open up a dam fully, it's going to allow that big flow of water, and then you hold it back with the dam to slow down the water flow. Well, when that electricity first comes into that uh, foot controller, it's much higher than once it hits the motor. And these are just some of the other components of a Husqvarna Viking uh, foot control. Up here is all the wiring that has to be done. Down here, you've got a number of copper contacts that have to be cleaned. You've got wires that have to be verified that are part of that entire uh, circuitry inside of that foot controller. One of the most complex foot controllers that's ever been made, quite honestly. And here you can see kind of what John was starting with. Um, that brown style, I would almost call it kind of an original... Japanese style type uh, foot controller, you found a lot of these on Japanese machines, um, was only rated at one amp. And it had been damaged at some point and also had a lot of rust in it. And so it would not come all the way up. So John was using it with it only having about this much clearance. If you can see my fingers, it only had about an inch of clearance between the bed of the foot controller and the pedal that you would step on. So he was getting about, probably about a sixth or a fifth of the power that he'll be getting now with this new foot controller. Plus he was working with, you can see his prong solution 
uh, because he didn't have the plastic casing for these, he was plugging these in uh, and they would have a tendency to fall out. They also, uh, you know, could make contact potentially with each other. Uh, it just wasn't the ideal solution. This is the ideal solution that I've supplied him with now. So he's got a real solid plug-in point and he's not going to get shocked off of it, it, shocked off of it or it's not going to damage uh, the machine potentially. And it's going to stay in place a lot easier. Quite a contrast when you look at those two foot controllers side by side, isn't it? Quite a contrast. So uh, John is going to be going from this to that now. Plus enjoying power that he's never ever had on this Swedish Beauty before. And here I'm done some of the rewiring on this new foot controller. Again, stealing parts off of another one and kind of rebuilding it. And I'm checking. It's kind of off screen. There it is. You can see that orange light that I've wired it correctly. I'm checking the electric flow coming in. And if you ever have a machine plugged in with a foot controller plugged in, just realize that foot controller is going to have as much electricity, actually more electricity flowing into it than the motor will. So just be real, real careful if you decide to have it plugged in with that cover off where you could potentially touch uh, the two uh, fields that are charged and get a real big shock off of it. Just be real careful. And on the Husqvarna controller, they've got these real cool little screws that thread in to hold the wires in place. It crimps them down fast and furious and it holds them in place very, very nicely. Just doing some more of the wiring on uh, John's foot controller. His new one. Running some more wires in. And this is part of the old foot controller that I ended up uh, stealing parts off of. You can see that one had some, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's why I do, I do hold on to some foot controllers even if they've got damage to them because sometimes you can steal parts off of them and you can create a new foot controller, which I needed to do in this instance. Here just continuing the wiring process and taking some parts off of this old foot controller that I needed for John's new one. There you can see the old foot controller I stole from on the right and the new foot, con foot controller that's just about complete on the left. That's going to be heading with uh, John's Type 21 machine back to Florida. Here again you're seeing some of the old with the new. Same thing. And that's John's new foot controller. Getting to put all the pieces back in. And I showed you that offset screwdriver, which is really nice for a situation like this, but it was so tight with that uh, cleated belt right there that I had to use a short, stubby little screwdriver piece uh, to turn those screws and to lock them into place so that that motor was... Firmly mounted, firmly mounted again to that bracket. And then finally when I got it to a point where that screw was high enough and was screwed deep enough into the motor and into that, uh, that bracket, I was then able to sneak in there again with that offset screwdriver and finish tightening down uh, that motor. Because that motor is going to be spinning up fast and furious and you can't have it kind of tight but not completely tight. So that took a little bit extra time, but it is what it is. That's what you got to do. And what, what you can see here is that I, I evaluated the wires coming directly off of the motor that are going to connect to the main circuit board in the back of the machine. And I felt like the motor wires were okay. But I had to address that issue uh, in the middle here. And then I also cut them back a little bit, and so I had a clean end on both ends. Uh, and I used a special, again, an oil-resistant, um, high heat-resistant type um, epoxy to seal those wires off so that they were not touching each other any longer or had the potential to do that.
In the back of John's machine, and I don't know if it happened in transit, uh, again, John's machine was padded pretty good, but it had a lot of space in the box. If you, if you didn't see the unboxing of John's machine, you should go back and watch that, because you'll see he had a, a decent uh, padding around the machine, uh, but there was a lot of empty space in the box, and so that machine had the potential to be bouncing up and down quite a bit. So I don't know if this happened coming from Florida to the workshop, or if it happened some time ago. But this is, as you can see in the shot, this is where you plug in the foot controller and it mounts to the machine and so that it's not compromised because there's a lot of electricity running through that area right there. I uh, filled that crack and compressed it uh, to try to affect a, a repair as best as I was able so that that area was stable again. And that's after the... Uh, oil resistant epoxy, it's a clear epoxy, went into that cracked area and then I uh, took this screw and snugged it back down once that, once that uh, epoxy um, set and was dried. But I'm using a special tool, you can see one of my dental tools, to press that down into the crack so that there was a good solid repair. Again, you're not going to get that if you go to a repair shop. <laughs> it's not going to happen. They won't even look at that part of the machine. So here I'm giving the bobbin winding assembly a bath. And again, the shots that I show you, I'm limited to a certain number of shots on Facebook, so I don't show you all the shots of every step because I just don't have enough space. They don't give me enough space. But this gives you an idea of basically flushing that out, taking uh, some of these pieces off that have been put on backwards and... Uh, put on in the wrong sequence so that the slow gear was not working. It had no ability to work. And that had to be very frustrating to John because John is a very smart technical guy that used to work on commercial and light industrial type machines but isn't as familiar with these types of machines and he's probably looking at this thing going, what am I missing? And uh, you know, unless you spend a lot of time working on these machines, I sometimes will look at something initially and I'll go, What's wrong with it? Why the heck isn't this working? Then I'll take a second look at it and a third look and all of a sudden it'll jump off the page at me and I'll go, oh, I see. So this is a special solvent that I put on there. It's almost like when you go to the car wash and it goes through those different phases of wash, uh, soak, uh, clear coat, uh, spot free, all that kind of, it goes through all those different, if you've never been in a car wash, put that on your bucket list too, because it's fascinating. I watch it just because I love watching how the machinery works, especially the laser ones that come within inches of your car, but they never touch you. I just think that's so cool. So this is my phase of soak, where I'm getting all of that grease and grime off of John's bobbin winding assembly, so that I can go in there, disassemble it, clean stuff that I couldn't reach with this solvent, which has to be done with dental tools and uh, also uh, brushes and then finally reassemble it properly so that you could see it perform flawlessly as it did during the premiere today. Again, John has never had a chance to use the slow gear. Number one, he didn't know about it. Number two, when I, when I, when I had a chance during our interview to tell him about it and explain how it works and he tried to engage it, it wasn't going to engage because it was, it was filthy as heck. It was uh, also assembled in the wrong way. So here's a real good shot that shows that bobbin winding assembly. Here you've got parts over here that have to be stripped. Here you have parts that have to be stripped with other solutions where that belt is going to be riding. This, this belt right here uh, is going to be uh, going between the, uh, uh, the, the assembly and the motor. So this is a critical pulley part of the assembly right here. And then you've got another one that's covered in that soaking solution right now that's going to have that long belt going from the bobbin assembly up to the balance wheel. So all these parts of the uh, bobbin winding assembly have to be cleaned, but you can't use the same cleaning solution on all of those parts. It's not going to work. And then there's certain parts that have to be stripped clean, other parts that have to be lubricated. It's a very complex mechanism, and there's a lot of things that have to be done to it. Take a look right there. This is kind of the before, looking at all of that grind between those cogs that are an integral part of that being able to shift gears to be able to go into that slow gear. And there's all kinds of grime and gook and yucky stuff in there that are 
going to inhibit that from working as well as it can. More detailed cleaning. Again, without dental tools, a lot of this would not be possible. And then certain parts of it have to be, uh, you have to use Q-tip swaps with a special stripping solution to get all that junk off of the other parts. This is the little piece that is on the side of the machine that you pull out to engage that slow gear. Uh, and when I disassemble the bobbin winding assembly, this is a piece that comes off as well because it has to be clean, but also oftentimes because it's being slid out, pushed back in, slid out, pushed back in, slid out, pushed back in, and the assembly that this slides over has screws on it that sometimes are not clearing this real well and so it ends up causing the plastic on the inside to become scarred and that was part of the case with John's as well so I had to go in there and address that initially with a dental tool and then after I got some of the big chunks off I then had to use a special uh, sander that's showing a little bit closer up. You can see, see how that's all scarred up inside of there? And that also makes it a lot more difficult, even if the bobbin assembly had been assembled correctly and had been absolutely cleaned and lubricated and stripped in all the right places, it still would have been tough to pull this out because it was all scarred on the inside of there. And this has to slide in and out past the inner stem that's part of that bobbin assembly. And it was just, it was catching on all of these plastic barbs. So here I'm going in with a, it's not a Dremel tool, it's like a poor man's Dremel tool. And I'm using a special grinder to try to strip all of those barbs of plastic off and get at least a rough surface that I can then sand down so it's nice and smooth. What do I have there? I'm trying to see. I'm measuring something and it's right around uh, four millimeters and I'm trying to remember what that is it might be it might be part of uh, a motor brush you have to forgive me I, I, I've been touching so many machines and I, I don't remember what that is I think it's part yeah it looks like carbon it looks like a carbon piece yep now we're focusing on the uh, copper wells that go into the motor because those were all those had major issues going on So that was, that was part of the carbon. And also I'm getting carbon out of the motor too. Carbon should not be qu quite as uh, granulated as this. It should stay, stay solid until the machine motor consumes it. And then there's some dust residue, but this is excessive. Also the spring had broken free of the carbon that was remaining in the well that had fossilized at the bottom and so that was having to be addressed as well and here you can actually see the branding on the motor which you can't see until you, until you take the motor cover off and you can see it's branded as a Westinghouse uh, 1.5 amp motor again I found them to be very fine motors the only difference is and this is how John and I ended up meeting and becoming friends is he had contacted me because I sell certain motor brushes on eBay and he had contacted me and said, I need motor brushes for a green Swedish Beauty. I don't think he said Swedish Beauty, but he, you know, my green Type 21 or whatever. And uh, I sent him the motor brushes, and they were for a Swedish motor, uh, which uses a larger motor brush than these Westinghouse ones. So that's how we got acquainted. Here I'm just going through trying to get these wells cleared. Also, I had to drill one of the wells out because... The um, someone at some point, I, I don't believe it was probably John, uh, but someone at some point had gone into one of those wells. Maybe they had a piece of carbon they were trying to get out of there or whatever. And uh, they'd used probably a screwdriver or something that caused a lot of, kind of the same thing as that puller, that puller piece on the side of the bobbin assembly. There was scarring and uh, there was the inside of those wells that should be straight and true on all four sides where that motor brush will slide in and they're made out of a very soft uh, copper had been deformed and distorted so I had to uh, reconfigure those uh, and reform them uh, so that the motor brushes would fit in properly but if you look down that well with my flashlight that's kind of what we were dealing with right there that's not the way it's supposed to look 
So I am using a drill with a special bit that's not going to scar the entire, um, uh, it's not going to scar the, uh, the edges or the bottom, but I'm able to shave it, almost shave it layer by layer to get it so that it's, it's shaped properly again so it will receive those motor brushes and uh, it'll create the electrical field that's supposed to be there. But you've got to be real careful. You don't want to use a regular drill bit because at the bottom of this well is the electrical center piece of the, um, the uh, motor assembly and it's got a very soft copper surface on it. So you'll, da you'll end up damaging that and then you'll have a, a motor that's worthless. So in order to do some of the rewiring, you have to take parts of this assembly off. Let me widen this shot a little bit. You have to take parts of this assembly off. There you can see the repair that I did to this crack piece that was on the rear of the machine. Then I took the light switch off uh, so that I could get into this area and reconnect uh, the motor wires so that the motor is connected to that junction point and will work. Now you can see one wire. You have to kind of, it's a real tight space in there is part of the reason you have to remove this light switch from being mounted on the machine to fit that in there. And then you have to tuck it, you have to basically tuck it a 90 degree turn uh, into the uh, tiny little screw point that's going to hold that wire in place and you have to get it all the way in there while you're managing not forcing this uh, switch out too far where you could damage the wiring or break the switch and at the same time you got this other wire that's in the way of it's it's a nightmare to get in there but eventually I got it and and I had to do the same thing then to this wire down here for the other motor connector You got to be real patient in my line of business. You have to be very patient. So there's more distance shot of kind of what I'm working with. That may be the last picture. Yep, it is. I just have one more set. You guys are real patient, but I think these are important that you see them, especially those of you that are on uh, YouTube but do not do Facebook. So now I'm over by, I've taken off the... Uh, the top and the bottom along with uh, the, uh, the feed dog cover as well and I've exposed the in inner part of that uh, free arm which has so many service points on it it's absolutely crazy so many service points and a lot of this has to be stripped down because there's just a lot of buildup on there and there was some rust as well right there you've got old oil and varnishing and that all, all has to be stripped off Here I'm using a dental tool to strip all that down and you can see it looks like it's quite a bit brighter and cleaner already. You see that compared to the other shot where it was real dark brown. And again, without that dental tool uh, and my magnifiers on, you could brush over those feed dogs five, six, seven, eight, nine times, you know, ten times, whatever. And you would miss a lot of the stuff that is stuck in between, not only the teeth, but also on the inside tracks of where the teeth are as well. There's a lot of stuff that gets built up in there. Some of it's thread, some of it's uh, uh, grease, dirt, oil, because when you lubricate the different uh, uh, critical points in the faceplate and the top of the machine, that oil and dirt and all that eventually runs down, and it oftentimes will... Uh, make its way into this free arm area and get stuck to this area and start to reduce the effectiveness of how those feed dogs pull the material. Even if you don't have a crooked roller foot on there. Imagine that. So this is uh, the rear of the free arm and it's really hard to kind of make out what's happening there but there are two critical worm gears on the back of that free arm and they have to be stripped down because they're interlacing and then you have to apply a grease like my special pink grease to those areas plus there's about three or four no five there's five lubrication points on the back of there that you have to lubricate with uh, machine oil so you've got a combination of machine oil and you've got grease depending on where you're putting it on those components on the rear of the free arm and those are going to be real essential because those are going to be spinning up at the same rate of speed as the raceway area. 
which I mean that you're talking some major RPMs. Also, a number of lubrication uh, points uh, in the uh, free arm area as well. Again, it has to be stripped and clean and then lubricated. Uh, and there's also lubrica lubrication pads that the Swedish designed for those spaces as well with the belief that, number one, if you're oiling the machine, it'll retain that oil longer and it also will absorb some of the excess oil so that it doesn't create a big mess. There's part of the free arm cover and you just see all the stuff that ends up landing in there. All kinds of junk. Now we've got the rear cover off of the machine and there's several lubrication points and service points on the rear there as well. There's our upper tension. Uh, again, if you watch any of the videos online or go into some of the blog groups, you'll hear people sometimes saying, all you need to do is take like a piece of fabric or, or whatever and run it between the, uh, uh, the, the tension discs, uh, which are these right here. And your upper tension should be good to go. If you embrace that belief, you're going to miss so much. And your upper tension is never going to be optimized to function as well as it can in concert with your bobbin case down below. You're going to get threads that break. You're going to get uh, uneven threads. You're going to get all kinds of challenges because that upper tension can't work the way it was designed to work. And you can see the um, tension disc on top that I've already serviced and the tension disc below that I haven't serviced yet. And that's not just varnishing. And this is how, this is how John was using the machine because he probably didn't, he didn't know how to disassemble it or he didn't think to disassemble it or whatever it was but this is what he was working with the whole assembly was like this and this is how it should look and I didn't re-chrome these so a little bit of the chrome is missing on that but it's it's absolutely clean as it should be and uh, I'm working on all the other components of the upper, upper tension at the same time but it's so essential that you not buy some of the junk that's put out there by people where they're telling you to the, the shortcuts or the life hacks on how you can service your machine when you're going to be sacrificing your machine by servicing it that way. You really are. Don't buy the lies, folks. Don't buy the lies. And that shows you the... Um, looking at it closer. That shows you one of the components that goes on top of those pressure discs that also has the same crud and rust build up on it as well. See that? It's not just one piece. You can even see the spring over here is all covered in rust too and varnishing. So if you run a piece of material through that upper tension, is it going to catch this? Is it going to catch that? Is it going to catch any of that stuff? No, it's not. It's not going to do a thing. So, uh, Shortcuts are wonderful sometimes. Life hacks are a blessing sometimes, but not when you're dealing with intricate pieces like this that are so essential to how that machine functions and operates. If you cut corners there, like I said, you're going to be sacrificing your machine. That gives you an idea of the condition of John's upper tension when I first began. Pretty crazy, huh? And John, when I when I share with him a little bit about some of the stuff I was finding, he goes, "Well, you know the rule, Scott. You don't you don't buy a car from a mechanic." <laughs> I said, "Well, what does that say about me? I, I started working on cars before I moved into sewing machines. So I hope people don't get the impression that they can't buy a machine from me because I used to be a mechanic working on cars, not professionally, just working with my dad and that, and then working on." exotic and collector type cars uh, he goes oh no 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 your process is perfect but I don't do a lot of that detailed maintenance stuff on these machines and I'm more familiar with the commercial and the industrial machines I said I get it I just appreciate you sending me your machine so I can do it for you that's totally cool so there's a distant shot of John's machine again I, this is before I did anything to um, the finish of it and you can see a little bit of that on the uh, face plate, you can see it kind of there as well.
And again, if I go over to the other workbench, it's not perfect. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but does it look better than with what I started with? Absolutely. And I wanted to do that for John. John is a, a man that I have a great deal of respect for. He's, uh, and I've said this, I'm repeating myself, but I'll say it again. He's a man that served our country with honor and distinction in the Navy. He's a man that served uh, the shuttle program uh, with, uh, you know, with NASA. And again, if you go to a service center, they're not gonna they're not gonna spend time to clean up all this chrome. Look at on the chrome there; it's more brown than it is chrome. And that's all varnishing and rust. But I wanted to do that for John because, uh, you know, he's he's a man that I respect greatly. Upper tension was that's while it was still in the machine before we pulled it out, and I found all the all the rust and everything. And I did fix John's uh, thread guide as well. I don't know if you remember that was uh, bent back when it was shipped. And what I did is I superheated it, and then I very very slowly bent it back into position so that it wouldn't fracture. So that is the original, where am I? That is the original thread guide right here on top of John's machine and I also re-chromed it as well. And not just for appearance, but the re-chroming it also protects it from rusting again too. I did the same thing with that and then I did the same thing uh, with his needle plate down here. So. Again, one of the reasons folks will invest more to send their machine to the workshop because you're going to get this level, this level of service, not just John's machine, but every machine that comes into the workshop. I go above and beyond to uh, when I ship that machine back to the customer. It's going to be a, it's going to be the same machine, but it's going to almost be like a totally different machine uh, because of all that's been done to it. This again is at the beginning stages of John's machine arriving at the workshop here I'm just doing some cleanup on the uh, faceplate if you remember in that other shot a couple shots back but it, you could see the varnishing and the rust into the paint on the uh, faceplate and here you can begin to see part of that shine coming back and I explained to John that because I had to take so many you know within the medical field they talk about dermal layers in other words, our skin, our skin has multiple layers going down uh, as you go deeper and deeper into the skin. It's the same thing when you're going into a, a job like this where you're trying to clean up the finish of a machine so it looks more like this and less like those other photos where it had all of that junk on it and getting, you know, getting to a point where it's looking more like that machine over on the workbench. Uh, you have to do that in such a way that you're stripping it down layer by layer by layer, but inevitably, because of all the damage that had occurred to John's uh, paint and his clear coat was all but gone, um, I eventually had to clean up the machine as best as I could, take those layers down to a, set, a safe level so that not all of the uh, patina was gone. It, was still, it still looked like a Swedish beauty, but all of, you know, the majority of that junk was taken away. And then I had to mask off the machine and I had to lay down a, a level of clear coat over the machine again to protect the remaining patina that was on the machine. Otherwise that would eventually start to flake and would degrade and then John would have, he, he, he wouldn't be back to square one because the machine would be clean, but the, the appearance improvements that I was able to bring to his Swedish Beauty would begin to drop off again because of the paint uh, not being protected. And here you can see in a little bit more detail part of that process in trying to take those layers down. Here you can see the actual color of what the machine was supposed to be just above the Husqvarna branding there. It's not this color. It's this color right here. You can see I'm using a, a brush and a special uh, cleaning solvent that's clean, uh, good at cleaning, but also safe to chrome and uh, safe to uh, the remaining paint that's on the machine. So I'm soaking in and I'm, I'm gently brushing over and over and over again. You can start to see some of the chrome coming back into appearance there. But that was a very slow, tedious process. There's not much you can do about the paint loss there unless the machine is completely paint, uh, painted again. 
But once I eventually masked, I, I had to mask the entire machine off and re-clear coat it, uh, that was that that uh, rub point right there where it's all the way down the bare metal was less evident and I was also able to protect it with the clear coat as well which is essential but you can see just how far gone it was look at all that you see that so that's kind of what I was dealing with and you had to deal with it very very slowly and very very patiently <laughs> Here up near the uh, face plate as well, you can start to see some of the original color of the machine peeking through there above the upper tension. The upper tension has not been cleaned yet, by the way. See that? So once again, if you go with the advice of some of these knuckleheads on the internet that say just run a piece of cloth through your upper tension and it's going to be good to go. <laughs> ah, no. Nope, 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 nope. So there you can see some of the actual color of the machine. That beautiful color that so many people admire about the Swedish Beauties. And then you can see what I was contending with right here. Made a little bit of a dent on top there. You can see that, that true color kind of peeking through. And I'll just say, I'll just say it again. You're not going to get this at a service center in your local town. If you do, give me their name, and I will send them a kudos letter. I might even send them a, a, a Soaholic poster. So all of this stuff you can see on John's machine, not just on the paint, but on the chrome as well, right there. You can see how, uh, how I mean, just awful that chrome is. That chrome should at least have some semblance of shine to it. And uh, some, you know, be some enhancement and beauty to the machine, and it's just not even close, not even close. And again, I hope you can appreciate if you're, if you are a Facebook person, you've already seen these. It just kind of reminds you again the amount of time that I put into projects and if your machine is here and you're like why hasn't Scott gotten to my machine yet why hasn't he gotten to my machine because as I am servicing some of the machines that are before yours I discover things like this and I cannot send that machine back like this to the customer I just won't even if it means me losing money on the project uh, I'm going to go to that extra effort of trying to send that machine back in a way that it's gonna it's gonna be improved now if you look at that get that get that fused in your mind the way that looks right now again it's not perfect but you can see the impact that I tried to bring And again, it's not a matter of, matter of just trying to wipe that stuff off. That stuff, like a cancer, gets deep into the pigment of the paint, well below the clear coat. It gets into the paint, and you have to take it down layer by layer by layer by layer uh, to try to eradicate it. Here's on the back of the machine. You can see we're starting to make uh, an impact. See there on the cloth, and you can see some of that color the natural color of that machine starting to come back through just beyond it on top you can see all of the junk that's still pitted and uh, embedded into the paint so it was it was rough I'll just say it the way it is it was rough and and uh, I don't think John John in the least would disagree with that it was it was in a real rough condition as far as the um, the machine and the paint here you can see we're starting to break that down I always say we, it's just me, folks. I always try to emphasize that. I, Hey, just me, it's just me. You see all the deferred maintenance there? It's just caked in oil and dirt and all kinds of junk. Here we've got varnishing and rust on that component that's part of the uh, Facebook, uh, Facebook, part of the uh, faceplate assembly.
And what I'm showing here is that um, there were some mis mix missed. Let me try it again. Mismatched screws that were on John's machine, and I had to switch out a number of different screws that someone else had put in. The threading was right, but the screw was wrong. It was either too long or too short. And so I explained to John that we had to replace a number of those. Plus here, John had found an extra part in one of his boxes. It's the one that's uh, closest to my thumb, the bigger one. And this is what he had holding the balance wheel on, which was the correct threading, but it was the wrong piece. Again, a Swedish beauty is supposed to be sexy and curvaceous and nice, clean lines. And that, that knob sticking out from the end just didn't complement that. So this is the correct... Uh, bolt that needs to go in there and it goes flush to the uh, to the balance wheel so it, you have a nice smooth curve on this on the uh, the right side of the machine and that's part of the that's the balance wheel taken off and what I'm doing is I'm doing some deep cleaning on that as well on the inside portion that mo most people would never even think of pulling off but because again, that's right next to the motor. It gets caked with a lot of the stuff that the motor sucks in. And then it eventually migrates from the inside of that balance wheel to the track that that belt is running over. And then all of a sudden you start having slippage issues and that belt will age much more quickly and break down because all that oil and stuff gets into the belt and then it causes those uh, the fibers of the belt in that to degrade. So getting all of that junk off, and this also had to be cleaned all around the outside edges as well. But look at that stuff. Is that what you want on your machine? So uh, again, if you went to a, a general service center, they would charge you 125 to 150 bucks and never come to any of these areas of the machine to service them, including this bobbin assembly. Quite honestly, most service people would probably be terrified to take it out because like I said you have to get it you have to get it balanced in there perfectly and get adjust get it adjusted in such a way that it's going to give uh, adequate but not excessive tension to the vertical belt and the horizontal belt on there and there's a lot of tweaking you have to do to get that sweet spot so they would just leave it alone and uh, while while John's belts were not in horrible condition uh, this one is starting to break on the right hand side so I replaced that uh, this is the short belt I believe and then you can see to the the one on the left side of the one that's broken is the new belt that I replaced it with there's the inside that the uh, the balance wheel slides onto and then it drives that power down the main shaft there's a lot of areas to clean and service inside of there as well Again, how many steps do I have in my process as you start to look at this machine in greater depth? All of a sudden, a 126-step process doesn't seem ridiculous because you're looking at all the components that make up this machine, this Swedish beauty, and you're saying, oh, yeah, I can see that. Just in that one area, there's got to be 20 service points. Just in that area, there's got to be another 25 service points. Over there, there's got to be another 15. All of a sudden, it opens up your eyes. So that inner belt that's orangey colored is the one that was on John's machine and it was starting to show a lot of wear on those uh, cogged uh, portions that are supposed to grip the wheel. This is the long belt. And that outer belt is the one that I sell on eBay and I put that new belt on John's machine so he would have really, really good traction and that power feed from the uh, bobbin winding assembly up to that main shaft. He wouldn't lose any of the bite of that motor. I mean, it would just get it done. Well, as you saw in the premiere today. And there's the bottom of the Swedish Beauty that I took off. Again, guess what? Never going to happen at a service center if you take the machine in. Take your Swedish Beauty into your local service center. They're not going to ever, ever, ever take off the bottom of the machine. Unless there's something broken, then they'll probably call me and say, how do you put this sucker back on? Because that's a little bit tricky too. But what I'm doing here is I'm breaking down all of that grease. This little well on the front is where the motor is going to be mounted. This other well right over here is going to be where that part of that bobbin assembly is uh, in conjunction with. And uh, all of that dirt, grime, junk has to be taken off of there 
uh, or it's going to eventually migrate back into the motor again. So all of that stuff has to be cleaned off before the uh, machine is reassembled. There's no there's no life no life hack to properly service a Swedish beauty. There's no life hack, folks. Sorry to tell you that. A lot of hard work. And here I'm putting on a I'm looking at uh, doing some measurements to put on a new power cord uh, for John because his was in pretty bad disrepair as you'll see in some of these uh, some of these shots. <clears throat> Not yet. You're not going to see him yet. <laughs> That's John's new foot controller. Doesn't that look a lot better than that other nasty brown one that looked like it, well, it, it was bad. It was real bad. Not only its appearance, but it also was not functioning properly. Again, it would not open up fully, so John was only getting about a tenth of the power from his Swedish Beauty, uh, even in the condition that it was in. So I, I didn't know how he sewed with it, but he did. He's a tough dude. So here I'm reinstalling uh, a new wire, a new wire lead, because the old one was uh, pretty broken down. And uh, there's quite a bit of, you can see that new wiring there, uh, there's quite a bit of disassembling that you have to do to get those wires uh, reconnected. Plus all of the copper contacts that are part of that whole junction right there have to be cleaned off as well. I did some research after one of the premieres where someone had said, um, they didn't say iron oxide, they said something else to describe what that green stuff is that sometimes appears on copper. And so I got curious because I'm not a scientist. Um, I have a graduate degree in, in science, a master's of science, but I don't have a science background. I'm not a biology dude. I did some of that way back when, but you know that was way back when and it was at a real low level. But I got curious, can copper rust or can electrical components, wires and such, can they get rust on them? The answer is yes. So it's a combination sometimes of a chemical change and sometimes it's a combination of enough moisture that you can get a combination of this oxide and also rust on some components that are in conjunction with electricity, including electrical outlets as well. So, you learn all kinds of stuff in this classroom, don't you? Here I'm just doing some more of the rewiring, and I'm also tightening uh, some of these tiny little screws. They are teeny tiny. These are out of order as usual. Here you're looking at the old, right there on the bottom. Doesn't that look horrible? And the new. A little bit of a difference. And again, this is the main power coming into the machine, so you want to make doggone sure that it is safe for John and anyone else that uses his machine. Maybe his uh, grandson, Nick, might also use the machine as well. Shout out to Nick! Shout out to Nick! Nick is uh, one of uh, John's grandsons, and Nick is on fire for sewing on fire for anything that grandpa's doing i think because like me obviously nick is his grandson respects his grandpa to the hilt and uh why wouldn't he right and so uh nick is really into sewing right now so nick might also use this machine as well but whoever uses it i want it to be i wanted it to be safe so here i'm stripping down wires i'm using one of my special uh wire strippers love that little stripper thing that you see in the picture right there it works real well and it doesn't damage the wires and it just does an excellent job of stripping down uh, the wires. <clears throat> Here again you can see just the contrast. Uh, the old that's still connected to the machine and uh, the new wiring. Which also if you look at the gauge of this wiring, it's almost like lamp cord compared to the power cord that I uh, ended up wiring to uh, John's machine. And why do I do that again? It goes back to that capacitor that you saw where that electricity going into that foot controller, which eventually, you know, it goes into the foot controller after it goes through this junction on the machine, then it eventually makes its way into the motor. If it can spike potentially all the way to 1,200 or 1,500 volts, you want, to have a, you want to have a power cord like this, not like that. 
There's no life hack for that either, folks. <laughs> There's no life hack for that. <clears throat> so here I'm just doing more wiring on the foot controller. We're back to the foot controller. We were at the, uh, the back of the machine before that. More wiring on John's new foot controller. Here I'm using a, a special oil heat resistant epoxy to seal off contacts where there's exposed wires. And even when this foot controller leaves the factory, when it left the factory in uh, Sweden, most of these contacts where there were bare wires, like this, uh, were not sealed off. And as I've explained in other premieres, Electricity is like water. Uh, if you don't seal off those main junction points that have bare wires that don't have any coating on them, it's part of the reason that you, when you wire something, generally that wire will have a coating around it, kind of like you just saw in the previous shot of the new power cord that I was putting on John's machine. If you don't seal off those points that have bare wire, that electricity is going to leak out and uh, you're going to lose power. You know, in extreme circumstances, and you may have seen these programs on TV, if you have extremely high voltage and you've got poor insulation on those wires, people can actually get hurt from that. The electricity will actually leak out, and uh, if someone comes in proximity to where that leaking is occurring from that, that real high voltage electricity, they can actually be killed by it. So that's why insulating wires is so critical, and I always try to do that on any bare wires in the foot controller or anywhere else on the machine motor area all those areas I try to seal them so that that electricity is not going to be a threat uh, or it's not going to uh, degrade the performance of the machine either that must be the last picture because it's not going anywhere or my internet went out again one of the two yep I guess that's it Oh, that's just my main page showing uh, some of the other premieres. All right, let's come off the tripod and we're going to wrap this up. And I better not forget to ring the bell. I've gotten some notes from people saying you keep, you, you either forget to ring the bell at the beginning and you ring it at the end, or you, these are my box closers. You know what I'm talking about? These are my box closers. So you saw all those pictures of John's machine before. Again, it's not perfect. But does that look like more of a Swedish beauty than the way the machine started? If any of you are wanting to say yes, put a smiley face in the chat. Or put a thumbs up. Or put a absolutely. Or whatever you want to type in there just to affirm that I'm not just totally on you know, prescription drugs or something like that. And I'm looking at it and it, I didn't make any impact at all. Again, it's not perfect, but I think it's better than when it arrived. And that's always my goal with every single machine, not just John's. Not just John's. All right, let me sit down and I'll ring the bell so I don't forget. So I, again, I appreciate your patience. I know that this has gone uh, a little bit long, but I think we covered some important stuff. I really do, and I think you had a great opportunity to see uh, John's machine performing at a level that really complements it and uh, highlights just how far this machine has come before I'm getting ready to pack it up and send it, send it on its way back to Florida. So uh, if you're on the fence and you've got a machine where you say, I, I know Scott could make a difference, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I'll do it, maybe I won't. Or maybe I'll do it next month, and then next month comes and goes, and then maybe I'll do it the month after that. And anyway, you just keep making excuses. All of us do it. All of us do it. It's, it's human nature. Resolve even before the new year, which is coming up soon. We're already heading into uh, November real soon. And uh, resolve even before the new year that you're going to finally do it. You're finally going to pack that machine up referring to one of my packing videos and doing it the right way and getting it here to the, the workshop safe 
and that you're going to do that you're going to honor that machine that really deserves to be brought back to a level where not only it feels better about itself but also you feel better about that machine every time you sit down to it isn't that what you want to do if you're sitting down to a machine you want to sit down with anticipation and, and excitement you don't want to sit down with dread like well i wonder wonder how it's going to do today whenever it's going to be a good day or a bad day maybe i should check my horoscope to see what it says about sewing today i'm not into horoscopes folks i'm just being i'm being sarcastic or flippant or whatever the word might be so uh any anyway, do like john smith a man that has an incredible history working with all kinds of sewing machines and yet the swedish beauty was just different enough and not familiar to him he said i'm not going to goof it up i'm not going to mess you know mess mess around plus i i want to save some time to go golfing because he's quite a golfer by the way I'm not sure if nick golfs or not but uh he just decided I'm going to pack it up and send it up to the workshop to my friend Scott. He'll take care of it. And I did. And I'll do the same thing for your machine. So resolve to do it. Right, Your Majesty? Yeah. All right. Well, this ends the premiere. I already rang the bell. So uh, God bless you guys. And I'm going to quote something different today. I've been quoting the same thing, which I think is a fabulous quote. And if you're new to this channel and you didn't catch it, well, that's just too bad. Go back and watch the other videos and then you'll hear it. <laughs> the quote that I, I, I've been doing is, is a good one. But here's another good one. I've got a couple of good ones. I'm trying to decide which one I want to give. I'm still deciding. I'm still deciding. Okay. Okay. I'll give this quote this time. The greatest prize in life is working hard at work worth doing. I think the full quote is actually far and away the greatest prize in life is working hard at work worth doing. But my point in sharing that quote is I have a great prize here and it's because of all of you and because of the John Smiths and the Annettes and the Juliettes and the list could go on and on, the Debbies and all of you, the Tonys, um, I could do a parade of incredible people that have taken that step of packaging up their machine or machines or jumping in the car and driving hundreds and hundreds of miles to come to the workshop because they recognize right away after watching premieres like this, there's no way in God's green earth I'm ever going to get the level of servicing on my treasure of a vintage machine by taking it to a local service center. I would rather drive six or 700 miles from Ohio or some customers that have driven all the way in from Arizona or California or North Carolina or shipped all the way from Canada or from Japan because they say there's nowhere else on this globe that I'm going to get that level of servicing. If I want my machine to be all that it can be, there's only one place to send it. Same thing is true if you want to buy a machine. I've got a lot of machines available as well. Resolve to do something, for goodness sakes. <laughs> Won't you? <laughs> all right, I'm to that tired point. I better hang up and let you all go, because uh, otherwise I'll ramble for a while. You know me by now. But I appreciate you all so much. And I don't know if you ended up jumping into or not jumping into that major contest for us hitting the milestone of 9,000 subscribers. I know for quite a while we only had one entry, and that contest may have ended with no declared winner. Again, we have to have at least three entries for any contest in order for it to be a contest. If we only get one entry, no contest. If we only get two entries, no contest. So if it ended with no winner, then I'll have to decide what I'm going to do with that very rare uh, Husqvarna Viking type 8e that even han said over in norway right next to sweden you, you never see them it's like a cam d or a cam e you just don't see the husqvarna viking type 8es especially not in the condition of the one that i offered to give away for the winner of that contest so if that contest ended with no winner it is what it is what i would encourage you to do is to get ramped up and to get prepared 
for the next major contest, which is when we hit 10,000 subscribers. All I can tell you is that the prize that I'm going to give away is something that anyone will fight tooth and nail to try to win. That's all I'm going to say right now. All right, y'all take care, and thank you again for your encouragement. Those of you that do Facebook and interacting with the posts that I make, uh, thank you for your encouraging comments. Thank you for your encouraging notes. Uh, encouragement goes a long way because, let's face it, I work pretty much in isolation in the workshop. I just have my friends, uh, the King, Dr. Singer, Mr. Bean, and Herr Obermeister. Other than that, I'm on my own. So when you all send a note or you post something of encouragement, it goes a long, long way. So I appreciate you all. Love you all. And uh, God bless you. Take care. Oh, and John, thanks for sending me this Swedish beauty. And uh, you're going to have a lot of fun, my friend.